right guys, for today's story, we're in Newport News, Virginia, and we're talking about a couple, Tawana Brinkley and Arthur Sanford. Tawana is 41 at the time, and Arthur is 51. Tawana and Arthur are a fairly new couple, but they are definitely head over heels in love. Everybody around them says, you know, they're kind of attached at the hip. You can't find one without the other. They're always together, always having a good time, loving on each other. That is until late night on December 3rd, 2003, up until the early morning of December 4th. Firefighters are called out to the apartment that Tawana and Arthur share. When firefighters make it to the scene, they realize that Tawana and Arthur are both in the apartment. So firefighters head in and they come to Arthur first and they find Arthur who has been severely burned. They say in the reports that he's burned so severely that the skin on his back is kind of just falling off of his body and he has several stab wounds. Unfortunately, when firefighters get to Tawana, she is deceased. She's been severely burned and she also has multiple stab wounds. Now, firefighters take note of a couple of things. I'm sitting here like a news anchor. <laughs> Firefighters take note of a couple of things. They realize that while Tawana was found in the bedroom of the apartment, Arthur was found closer to like the entryway of the apartment in the living room. They also noticed that this fire had kind of started in the bedroom and it burned through a mattress and kind of almost burned up to the ceiling. Like this wasn't a regular house fire. This was a huge fire and almost kind of like an explosion. They found an empty bottle of rubbing alcohol and they could kind of smell the rubbing alcohol. So they think maybe the rubbing alcohol is what accelerated this fire. And they can also notice that there is blood all over this apartment. Obviously, police and detectives are involved and they don't treat this as a regular house fire. You know, they treat it as an arson and homicide. So after the fire is put out and detectives come out to the scene, police officers can see that Tawana was stabbed more than 11 times all over her body and that there was blood everywhere. All over this apartment, there was blood in the kitchen and in the bathroom and in the living room. Blood splatter is everywhere. And they also realize that Tawana had been stabbed with multiple different things. They find a small like pocket knife in the apartment that had Tawana's blood on it and also a big larger kitchen knife that was also used to stab Tawana. So police officers start their investigation guys and they want to start with Arthur obviously because he's the only living witness that they have but his health condition is just so bad he's in the ICU being treated for burns all over his body and authors doctors do not allow Arthur to be interviewed. So detectives start with questioning the neighbors in the surrounding apartment buildings. And neighbors report hearing a commotion. They hear Tawana screaming and they hear chaos, like furniture being turned over, like they hear something really extreme happening in their apartment. So the neighbors do call the police and the police come out. But by the time the police officers get to Tawana and Arthur's apartment, there's silence. There's no more commotion. They knock, but nobody answers. So they can't do anything. And because there's no longer a commotion, because there's no longer someone screaming inside the apartment, police can't just barge in, so they leave. And after the commotion, a neighbor also reported seeing someone knocking at Tawana and Arthur's door several times, coming back and forth to the apartment. And she says that she thinks this person might have been Tawana's son, but she doesn't really get that good of a look at him. So detectives go ahead and decide to talk to Tawana's son. So detectives look into Tawana's son and they check his background. And he's got like some drug and weapons charges on his record and he has also just been released from jail. He was in jail for 10 months. So they decide to bring in Tawana's son. His name is Darnell. They question him and they ask him, you know, about that night. And Darnell says that, yeah, he did come to his mom's apartment on the night in question because he had left something over there like he had forgot his jacket and his jacket had his keys in the jacket pockets so he needed his jacket but he said he thought it was so weird because he had talked to his mom earlier that day and um, let her know that he was going to come over and so they had planned to see each other but when he got to the apartment he was knocking and couldn't get an answer and he said he could kind of like hear and feel that someone was in the apartment but he still couldn't get an answer and he said that he had been going back and forth from the apartment because he went to the corner store like around the corner to call the apartment he would get no answer and then go back and try to knock on the door again and then go back to the corner store call again but he couldn't get anybody so eventually he just left 
that. And he says from the time that he originally got to the apartment and went back and forth from the apartment to the corner store a couple of times, it was from 5.30 to about 7. And detectives ask Darnell flat out, like, did you kill your mother? Did you have anything to do with this? And Darnell says no. He says that, you know, obviously he and his mother didn't see eye to eye on a couple of things. You know, he was having trouble with the law, but that was his mom. She had raised him as a single parent. He had a lot of respect and a lot of love for his mom. And he swore that he had nothing to do with his mom's death and the fire of the house. But what Darnell does tell police is a little suspicious. He tells police that they should look into Arthur because Arthur has a very shady past. He says that Arthur had also just recently gotten out of prison and that his family, Tawana's family, did not like Arthur or his past and they had brought it up to Tawana on several different occasions but Tawana didn't care because she was in love but Darnell says, y'all looking at me, you need to be looking at Arthur. Now, of course, like we said before, police cannot talk to Arthur because he is really in critical condition and trying to recover from his very severe burn wounds. I can't say burn wounds. <laughs> He's recovering from what happened to him in the fire. And police go out to search the apartment just to try to collect some more evidence. And as they're searching the apartment, they find a crack pipe and like some other evidence of severe drug use in the apartment. So they wonder if this was maybe like a drug deal gone wrong or something like that. But they just don't have very much information. So they reach out to the public, they reach out to the media to ask if anybody has any kind of information, you know, to please come in and talk to detectives. So on December 6th, someone does come in to talk to detectives. This man's name is Corey Ramsey and he says that he went to Arthur's house in the night in question to collect some drug money. Like a drug debt like Arthur owed him money for drugs so he went by to collect it but he thought it was weird because he didn't go by on his own Arthur called him to say hey I got this money for you man come get it and so he went and Corey Ramsey tells police that when he got to the apartment it was super weird because it was very dimly lit he said the lights were super low and he was very confused as to what was going on in this apartment. And he says he also thought it was weird because there was no sign of Tawana. But Corey Ramsey doesn't ask any questions. He gets his money and he leaves. And he says all of this happens at around midnight, which is right before the fire starts. And also rules Darnell out as a suspect because you know, he was there at around 5 37 o'clock. And Corey says he was really alarmed because when he got home and unfolded his money and started counting it up, he realized that there was something on the money that looked like blood. And investigators are like, okay, well, can you give us this money? Can you produce it? And Corey says that he bleached it. But Corey says that he doesn't have anything to do with the murder and um, they ask him to take a polygraph test. He takes the polygraph test and he passes. So police rule him out as a suspect. So police take Darnell's advice and they decide to look into Arthur's background and they realize that in 1983 Arthur went to jail for killing his girlfriend. They said one day in the home that he shared with his girlfriend and her 16 year old son the 16 year old son burst into the bedroom to the sound of his mom kicking and screaming and he realized that Arthur was stabbing her. And he was stabbing her viciously when the 16 year old son burst into the room. Arthur started going at him and the son had to crawl out of a, of a bedroom window to get away from Arthur, giving his mother a chance to run away. But as his mother is running away, Arthur starts chasing her and starts stabbing her from behind. The woman makes it to the house of her neighbor where she unfortunately passed away. Now the crazy thing is Arthur for this crime is sentenced to 40 years but he only serves eight and he's released. But after his release he breaks his parole and has to serve another nine years. And he had been out of jail for this murder for only nine months before he met Tawana. Now investigators really want to talk to Arthur and get his statement from the night and it takes five months after the fire for Arthur to be physically well enough to talk to detectives. So police talk to Arthur and Arthur tells them that on the night in question an intruder breaks into the house, stabs them both, takes a couple of things and um, then sets a fire and leaves. Which is kind of what he says briefly to one of the firefighters on the night in question. Like before they take him in he mentions that there was an intruder 
before he's taken into the hospital. And police had always known that Arthur had made that claim. So in the past five months, Arthur was in the hospital. Police had been looking for evidence to support that there was in fact an intruder in the house, but they really couldn't find any. And what really stood out was that the house was locked. Like the house was locked from the inside. So like you're saying an intruder came in and did all this, but then he locked the door before he left. Like that was really weird. And they just couldn't find anybody else's DNA in this apartment. The DNA in the apartment only was Arthur and Tawana. And police officers also feel at a disadvantage because Arthur has had five months to lay up in the hospital, burned up and come up with, you know, a story. And Arthur is very much playing into his injuries and saying that he doesn't really remember anything from the fire and he doesn't give the police much. He's very vague. So eventually the case goes cold without any evidence to support that he did or didn't have anything to do with everything that happened on the night in question. The police really can't do anything else. It is until 2009 and in this area a cold case unit is opened and a new detective picks up this case and you know starts looking at it with fresh eyes like they say and starts diving deeper into the evidence. The first thing he realizes after looking into Arthur's medical records is that his stab wounds and the cuts that he suffered are very extremely superficial, especially compared to the kind of violent, extremely aggressive stab wounds that Tawana had suffered. They realized that Arthur's stab wounds were very superficial and kind of just like slices and dashes kind of things, whereas Tawana had been aggressively stabbed. This new detective also has all the DNA collected from the scene tested again, and again, they found no trace of any outside DNA. All the DNA collected from the scene belong to Arthur and Tawana. And so the detective comes up with this theory. He says that on the night in question, Tawana and Arthur, or just Arthur on his own, had been using drugs and that he and Tawana got into a regular argument that kind of escalated because there was drug use involved and that in the spur of the moment in the midst of the argument Arthur attacked Tawana and that they had this big blowout argument and you know they got into it and they had a physical altercation all around the house and he was kind of stabbing her as she was trying to get away from him as he did with the woman prior in the 80s which would also explain all of the blood spatter all around the apartment. The detective also says that he thinks Arthur called up Corey Ramsey to come collect his money that night after smearing Tawana's blood on the money because Corey was a known drug dealer and he had some other, you know, troubles with the law and he kind of wanted to like pin Corey for the murder. He says that after Corey left, that's when Arthur decided to kind of set up the apartment as a crime scene. He moved Tawana's body to the bedroom and that's when he lit the fire to kind of cover his tracks. But as Arthur is kind of setting this up and spraying alcohol everywhere to light this fire, he accidentally blows the damn apartment up and that's how he suffered his severe burn wounds. So they go ahead and put out an arrest warrant for Arthur, but Arthur is on the run. He is nowhere to be found until June 30th of 2010, seven years after the murder of Tawana Brinkley. In October of 2012, Arthur finally stands trial and the prosecution paints Arthur out to be a very wild, jealous man. They bring up obviously the previous murder. They also were able to find a letter that Arthur wrote, kind of like a diary entry where he was talking about Tawana being like a cheater and that she was cheating with somebody in an upstairs apartment. People in the upstairs apartment that Arthur said that she was having an affair with were very young underage boys and both of the boys and the boy's mother said that they had never even met Tawana. And they said because Arthur was already a very jealous and aggressive man, that coupled with his drug use just made him spiral out of control on the night that he killed Tawana. They also bring forth Arthur's clothes from the night in question. They were splattered with Tawana's blood. They also brought up the fact that even though Arthur was burned very bad, he had no severe stab wounds the way Tawana did. So on November 1st, 2012, Arthur was found guilty and charged with second degree murder and sentenced to 40 years, the same sentence he got for the first murder. And it's just so crazy to think like if he would have never gotten out of jail the first time, none of this would have even happened. But I But this story is so crazy. Like when I was reading the story, I was ready to box. Like I was mad. I was so mad. Oh, it's really frustrating. Especially the last little bit that just came out recently that I told you guys about at the end of the video. 
y'all gonna be mad. But buckle up, because the story is a doozy. It's frustrating. You're gonna be thinking about it next week and you're still gonna be mad about it. So I'm not gonna ramble for too long. Let's just get on into it. What I'm not gonna do is make y'all look at my crusty ass lips the whole video. Hold on. All right, guys, so today we're gonna be talking about the disappearance of Janelle Carwell. Like I was saying, Janelle disappeared the day before her 16th birthday. She was planning a party, she was excited, it was her 16th, her sweet 16. So can you imagine like, I'm sure most of us here are older than 16. So just think back to your sweet 16 when you were 15 and how excited you were. But Janelle was known to all her friends and family to be super loving and super caring. She was very smart, she did very well in school and she had dreams of becoming a doctor and going to medical school after she graduated. But all of Janelle's hopes and dreams would be put on hold when her mom calls 911 to report her and her stepfather, Leon, missing. So in the 911 call, Janelle's mom, Tanya, tells the 911 dispatcher that Janelle and her stepdad, Leon, left the night before at around 1 p.m. So at the point that she's making the 911 call, it had been a day. It's not the next morning from the time they left, it's the next day from the time they left, if that makes sense. I wanted to clarify that because um, it's not the morning after your daughter's been gone and left in the middle of the night. It's the whole next day. So she tells the 911 dispatcher that Janelle and Leon had left at around 1 a.m. the day before to go help one of Leon's friends who was having car trouble. Now, Leon's friend was having car trouble in the Clarks Hill area and they live in Augusta. So they traveled about 30 minutes away from their home in Augusta to go help this friend Leon had who was having car trouble. Janelle's mom tells the 911 dispatcher that Leon's phone is not a phone that has GPS. So Janelle went with him with a phone that has GPS so they could locate this friend and so that Janelle could work the GPS because Leon just didn't know how to do it. And um, they left and she hadn't heard from them since. She said she'd been calling, texting, both their phones no answer. She just hasn't heard from them at all. Ma'am, um, I was calling to report a missing person. Give me one second. I pray to God that they not only and tested and leave a message. Your husband and your daughter are missing? What? I've been calling and tested. You're not answering? Neither one. And that's not like neither one of them because they see me calling. They go and his cell phone don't have a map on it where you, you know, get direction or whatever. So he got my cell phone. And so at this point, um, Janelle's been missing for 24 hours, her and Leon. Nobody's heard anything from them. Nobody's seen or spotted them. I'm not sure like why there's no like Amber Alert. I'm sure like there are certain requirements you need to meet, but Janelle was 15. Like, I'm not sure what the requirements are, but I feel like in this circumstance, like she should have, like there should have been an Amber Alert, but there wasn't. So police are involved at this point, but nobody sees any sign of Janelle or Leon for about two weeks. During this two week period, Janelle's mom is featured on a couple of different Facebook lives. She's friends with like someone in the area. I think the woman is a pastor and uh, she does a lot of Facebook lives talking about Janelle, trying to raise, raise awareness for the case. And you know, this these Facebook lives go kind of viral, so there's a lot, a lot of media attention. There's a lot of people in the community wondering about Janelle, looking for Janelle. Like there are a lot of people and community involved in this case. The city was very invested in Janelle and bringing her home. And so in these Facebook Live posts, Janelle's mom is basically telling her story and she's trying to explain because people are questioning like, okay, why did you send Janelle? Why did Janelle go? Like, why didn't you go? If Leon needed help, like why'd you send your 15 year old daughter? Why didn't you go? Um, and she says that because she says that because she has two forms of cancer, she couldn't go, like she wasn't feeling well. Like in the Facebook Live, she says something about smoke. She said there was smoke. I don't know if like Leon was smoking or people were smoking around her and the smoke was making her not feel well. So she laid down and Leon and Janelle went instead of her. I wasn't able to find the full Facebook Live videos, just snippets, but she said something about smoke and smoke making her not feel well. So Janelle went instead of her. That was the first red flag for me. Hold on to that because we're gonna come back to that later. I don't wanna get ahead of myself, but 
hold on to the fact that she told the whole ass internet that she had cancer. Now, like I said, two weeks went by without any sign of Janelle or Leon until April 26th when the white pickup truck that Janelle and Leon left in is found abandoned on side the road. Now the truck is abandoned, but there's still no sign of Leon, still no sign of Janelle. You know, police officers, FBI, whoever, they process the truck and there's no signs of foul play, no signs of like anything criminal happening, no blood, you know, nothing suspicious basically was found in the car. The car was in perfect condition. The only weird thing was that the car was found less than a mile away from Tanya's home in Augusta. So that was a little weird. So that was a little weird to police and they finally decide to kind of kick their investigation up a notch and they decide to pull phone records. Now the gag is, and this is red flag number two for me, that their phone records for Janelle and Leon never ever ever pinged outside of Augusta, Georgia. They never pinged in Clarks Hill where they said they were going. So now police have no record and really no real evidence that Janelle and Leon ever left Augusta or even left the house on the night in question. And police are also worried because, you know, it was Janelle's Sweet 16, she was about to have a big birthday party. They were planning a cookout, like, you know, sis was ready for her Sweet 16. And she was a 15 year old girl, so she was very much into the social media before her disappearance, before her mom reported her missing. Her social media was popping, you know, she was a 15 year old girl. She was on Instagram, on Facebook, like, you know, you know how it is. But since being reported missing, there had been absolutely no activity on any of Janelle's social media. So that was also a big, huge red flag for police officers. I got my notes right here, y'all. This case had me stressed out, all right? Now with all this going on and the police amping up their search and the community really rallying behind Janelle and looking for Janelle, in part due to all of the Facebook live streams that her mom had been featuring on, like the city was behind Janelle 100%. And so witnesses started to come forth and witnesses started to come forth to say that they had been seeing Leon in the Atlanta area. Now, uh, I'm gonna include maps and stuff because I know it can be a little confusing because we're talking about three different cities. But just to give you guys a recap, Leon, Tanya, and Janelle live in Augusta. Tanya said that they went to the Clarks Hill area, which is not in Atlanta, it's in, I think, South Carolina. But um, from Augusta, it's only about a 30 minute drive. It's in a different state, but it's only about a 30 minute drive. And witnesses are coming forth to say that they had seen Leon in Atlanta. And whereas the Clarks Hill area is about 13, 13, 30 minutes away from Augusta, Atlanta is about two hours, maybe two and a half hours away from Augusta. So witnesses come forth saying that they've seen Leon in Atlanta and that he's basically kind of hopping from house to house, staying with different friends and family around Atlanta. <clears throat> and to me, it sounds like you on the run. You know, you house hopping, couch surfing, not staying in one place for too long. Like, what are you hiding from? Your stepdaughter is missing. Why aren't you around? Why aren't you, why aren't you present? But that's just me, that's just how I feel. And for me, that was definitely red flag number, what, three, two, four, whatever. And not only did witnesses come forth to uh, say that they had spotted him in Atlanta during all this time where police are out looking for Janelle and the community is out looking for Janelle, people say that he had made several trips back and forth, like two or three trips back and forth to Augusta from Atlanta while all of this is going on, which is really crazy to me. Like, how did nobody see him and turn him in? Like, what is going on? But nobody turned him in. You know, he was just flopping around, going back and forth like his daughter was not missing. And that red flag, kind of red flag. So it seems as though Leon is purposefully invading the law and making himself scarce, even though he knows that, you know, people are out looking for him and Janelle. So now I'm gonna just give y'all a little bit of backstory on Leon and on Leon and Tanya's relationship because I feel like it's very uh, important to this case. So, <laughs> Leon and Tanya got married while Leon was incarcerated. Leon was incarcerated on like some assault charges 
and some cruelty to children's charges. Okay, and um, it's not like they knew each other before prison. Tanya met Leon in jail and um, they blossomed a relationship while he was in jail, got married while he was in jail. And when he got out, he came straight home into the home that Tanya shared with Janelle. And Tanya has another daughter, but she's not mentioned in any of this. Um, I assume she's okay. She's younger than Janelle, so I think that's why um, she's not really mentioned. Like, I'm pretty sure she's a small child, so. I'm not gonna say too much about her because, you know, but can you imagine? Like, I can't, e first of all, I can't even imagine meeting somebody incarcerated, especially for assault charges, especially for cruelty to children's charges, falling in love, marrying him, and then paroling him to my house with my kids? Ah, mm -mm. Let me know what y'all think in the comments below. And um, we know that all people who are incarcerated are not terrible people. We know that men um, go into the jail system and they are re rehabilitated and they come home and they do what they're supposed to do. But you can't prove that to me from the jailhouse. You gotta prove that to me outside the jailhouse. I'm not bringing you home to my children, but um, that's just me, that's, that's just me, that's just me. So that's just a little background on Leon, we're gonna hop right back into it. So now at this point, you know, witnesses have come forward saying that they've seen Leon, but still nobody has seen any, any, any sightings of Janelle. So police are realizing at this point, okay, something ain't right. Like everybody's seeing all these sightings of Leon, no Janelle, he's been back and forth to Augusta in Atlanta. And police realize that Leon is basically on the run. You know people are out looking for you. You know people are out looking for your stepdaughter. You haven't come forward. You're house hopping, couch surfing, evading. You know, it's suspicious, it's real suspicious. Lots of red flags being thrown up and around, especially with his past criminal convictions. So police go ahead and issue a warrant for Leon's arrest on kidnapping charges. So when police issue this warrant for Leon's arrest, Tanya starts acting very, very weird, very, very suspicious, okay? She is on Facebook Live saying the police have it all wrong, Leon is not involved, but she's taking up for him without there being like an ulterior like explanation, like she's saying Leon didn't do it, Leon had no involvement, but she's not saying like how, if that makes sense, like, okay, he didn't do it, then what happens? You know, like there's no what happened. There's a he didn't do it, but there's no what happened. So in these Facebook lives, Tanya kind of switches gears from being, you know, focused on her daughter and uh, focused on bringing her home to kind of shifting her focus to, Leon didn't do it, Leon didn't have nothing to do with it, that's my man and he didn't have, you know, y'all know how it go, all right? And police are seeing this and the police are like, okay, well, all the evidence is pointing towards him. He's on the run. What do you know that we don't know? You know what I'm saying? It gets real suspicious. And it's just so weird. I can only speak for myself and how I would respond to this situation, but if anybody leaves the house with my sons at, in the middle of the night and you come back and you don't come back with my babies, it's the blame game. It, if it's my husband, if it's my mom, if it's my dad, if it's my uncles, if it's my aunt, you cannot leave with my kids and then not come back with my kids without me putting the blame on you. Where's my babies? What happened? You know. Tanya should have been turned on Leon. How the hell you leave with my, like what? It don't make sense to me. It wasn't making sense to the community and it sure as hell wouldn't make sense to the police. Okay, let me shut up and get this lash glue on. All right, we got our lashes secured. Let's hop back into the story. So regardless of how Tanya was feeling and taking up her man in the media on Facebook, Police were not having it. The police knew that there was just more to this story. They realized that Leon was pretty much damn near on the run. So they really kick it in the high gears to get some answers and um, find Janelle. So on May 23rd, US Marshals set out on a manhunt in Atlanta to find Leon and bring him in. And they tracked down Leon to a U-Haul facility. And can I just say, it's not a true crime video unless there's a U-Haul facility or a storage facility involved. You know, like, if you watch True Grammy, you know, it's always some mess going down in the storage facility. So y'all, they track him down to the U-Haul facility, and guess who's with him? He's not alone. <laughs> guess, 
Guess who's winner? I'm gonna give you a few seconds to place your bets while I get my foundation on. Guess who is with Leon at the storage facility? If you guessed Tanya, ding, 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 you're 100% correct. When the U.S. Marshal finally catches up to Leon, he is at a U-Haul facility with Tanya. So, of course, police were extremely shocked to find them both together. So, finding the two of them together was kind of like the last straw, the last nail in the coffin for police officers and detectives. They knew for a fact at this point that something had happened to Janelle and that there was way more to this story than they had originally thought. So police go ahead and arrest them both. They arrest Leon on the kidnapping charges and they arrest Tanya on um, hindering an investigation or something like that. And y'all tell me why Tanya told police that her and Leon were together simply just by pure mere accident. She says that she was driving down the highway, minding her business, going to Atlanta to look for Janelle and she just happened to pass Leon walking down the street, walking down the middle of the highway. So she picked him up, the man that was last seen with your daughter. You just pick him up off side the road and now y'all at the U-Haul facility. Pure, pure coincidence. <sighs> like, to me, silence is better than a bad lie. How you gonna lie to these, like that's a lie you tell to a child. How you gonna lie to these grown ass police officers and detectives that do this for a living? You just, accidentally ran up on the man that was last seen with your daughter keep it keep it my under eyes are a little creasy because i didn't put on um eye cream so i'm gonna go in with this concealer because it's a little bit more hydrating just wanted to explain that since this is the third concealer i've used <laughs> in this video and i'm glad at this point that they finally um just arrested tanya too because she been lying and she ain't been doing right. She's been very suspicious. I meant to mention this earlier in the story, but there's even like a news article and a quote. I'm gonna put it right here so you can read it, but I'm gonna read it out to you as well. Let me flip back to it in my notes. Okay, I thought I had written it down word for word in my notes, but I didn't, but I'll put it on here and I'll just like give you an ad lib. Basically, a reporter asked Tanya, you know, cause people are speculating, people are trying to figure out what happened to Janelle. She left with Leon and never came back. So, um, you know, the reporter asked her, well, is there any way that Janelle and Leon have, you know, some sort of a relationship and they ran away together? And Tanya is quoted in saying, I'm not, it's not a direct quote, I'm put the direct quote right here. But she basically says, you know, Leon has me and I'm so beautiful. Like, why would he want to run away with her when he has me? Basically, like, I'm so pretty, I'm so beautiful. Why would he want to run away with her? Ugh. And I just, I know there's a lot of things my mama would say if I went missing, but that sure as hell ain't one of them. All right, <laughs> make sure you read the direct quote that's up here on the screen because I'm just saying it from what I remember. But y'all, what? What? Like that just threw me. I was I was done at that point. To where, um, you know, police have Leon and Tanya in custody and police are noticing that Tanya and Leon's stories keep changing and Tanya and Leon's stories keep deviating from each other, you know, now they aren't talking to each other they aren't in contact so stories are switching up things is changing and eventually leon he tells police an entirely different story totally different from the one that um they had originally you know planned leon tells police that on the night in question instead of going to the clark's hill area like um they told Tanya that they were going to do. They went to Atlanta instead. And once they got to Atlanta, Leon let Tanya out of the car. Not Tanya, I'm sorry. Leon let Janelle out of the car. He gave her some money to catch the bus back home and hasn't seen her since. Now, just a double back in case you forgot. I know it's a lot of information. They are in Atlanta. Leon says they're in Atlanta two hours away 
from their home in Augusta. Janelle is only 15 the day before her sweet 16th birthday and you give her money to catch the, catch the bus back home two hours away? She's supposed to ride the bus two hours and you know like how buses work. It's not a straight boom, boom, two hours. You know, she stops and huh? In the middle of the night? That don't make no sense. That don't make no sense. That don't make no sense. Now, when police go back and tell Tanya this story, of course, Tanya is dumbfounded and gooped because that's not what we rehearsed. You know, she is very taken aback. And it's also at this point while they have Tanya in custody that they realize she was lying about having cancer. The two forms of cancer that she said hindered her from going with Leon, the reason why she stayed in Augusta and Janelle went with Leon, her alibi excuse was a lie sis does not have cancer. Which I'm sure we all saw that coming, right? Since the girl been suspicious from jump, I was totally not surprised. At this point, now that the police have told Tanya this new story that Leon has come with, she don't have no rebuttal, she don't have no nothing. They realize that uh, she's lying, she's a lie and the truth ain't in her, all right? Um, they realized that Tanya knew way more than she had let on and that she was probably lying and covering things up for Leon. They realized that she probably is more involved than she let on and that all the lying she's been doing was uh, to basically save Leon and uh, get the police off of his back. And so the police are doing their jobs. They're doing the interrogations. They're asking Leon what's going on. They're asking Tanya what's going on. And eventually Leon cracks and um, he tells police that Janelle is no longer with us. But other than that, uh, Leon and Tanya aren't saying much else until March 11th of 2018, almost right at a year since Janelle's disappearance. A citizen and I couldn't find if this person was like a part of people searching for Janelle or if it was just a citizen who randomly came across it but they came across a bone sticking out of a shallow grave in the back in the backyard of an abandoned house a crew comes out to recover the body and the body is identified as Janelle Carlo and um, after the remains are identified, police charge both Leon and um, Tanya with murder. And they charge them with concealing death. And unfortunately, that's kind of just where this story ends for the time being. I don't think I made it clear in the beginning, but this all just happened in like 2017, 2018. And um, um, Tanya and Leon have yet to um, have their day in court. And I'm sure that's of course been slowed down by the virus. We don't yet know exactly what um, Janelle's cause of death was. It hasn't been released to the public. We don't know. Um, at what point during all this, Janelle passed away. Um, I read somewhere, I read a snippet that um, Janelle was found, like her remains were found bound, um, you know, like feet tied, hands tied. But um, I don't know her cause of death. I, I really don't think I even want to know. I don't wanna know what her mom did. I don't wanna know what the stepdad did. Like I just, she's a little girl, like nothing she could have done should have warranted this like it just doesn't make sense i think no one knows cause of death would just make me live it honestly i just i wanted to box when i was done reading this story i wanted to i wanted to fight like i told you guys in the intro uh just recently in june 2020 of this year prosecutors added more evidence to this case to prove that on three separate occasions tanya and leon had tried to hire her a hitman to kill Janelle. Like they had sought out someone to kill Janelle once in September 2015, once in December 2015, and once in October 2016. So they had been trying to like, what, what could this little girl have done? Absolutely nothing. It makes no sense. I hope they both get put underneath the jailhouse because I'm just, I put this lipstick on knowing my lips was crusty. Hold on, let me fix that. But now I just kind of want to know like what you guys think happened as far as like motive because we still don't have a motive that probably won't come out 
until um, Tanya and Leon have their time in court or if they're staying hush lip, then we may never know. But um, to me, it seems as though like, just like from the statement that uh, Tanya gave the reporter that maybe there was some jealousy that Tanya was jealous of Janelle. Um, for whatever reason, maybe there was some kind of I don't want to say relationship, but, um, well, I guess I can say relationship, whether it was, um, consensual with Janelle's consent or not. Maybe Leon was assaulting Janelle or something. Leon was giving Janelle attention that, that Tanya didn't like. So that was kind of Tanya's motive to get rid of Janelle and maybe Janelle wanted to come forward and speak out against Leon and that was Leon's motive. Like that's the only thing that I could really think of and uh, obviously it was pre-planned because they were hiring hitmen, you know. And there was a little bit of um, speculation in the news reports about the community thinking that there was somebody else involved, but um, that person doesn't come forward and Leon and um, Tanya haven't mentioned a third person, but um, I did see, <clears throat> excuse me, in a couple of different news articles and uh, little news clips, like video clips that I watched that a couple of people in the community had thought that there was somebody else involved. So I don't know guys, like it's just so much that's still up in the air about this case because it is so fresh and so new and because Tanya and Janelle still haven't gone to court and had their day in court. But it's just so sad because people were really out looking for Janelle and the whole time Tanya and Leon knew where they where you know where she was and what had happened and um like people were out in the heat looking for Janelle people were passing out I saw one news clip where it said a woman who was out searching for Janelle because of the heat like in heat exhaustion she had to have a spinal tap like the community was really rallying behind Janelle um if I remember I'll put some of the news clips and stuff in the description so you can go just watch them and um it's really beautiful to see how the community really rallied behind janelle and was really you know looking for her tanya's facebook page is still up i went to her facebook page and it's so crazy to see like how the community was you know backing and rallying tanya before she was convicted and before she was arrested and then like people on her page after at this news and to see how people reacted like after they found out that basically Tanya had hoodwinked and bamboozled them. Like you can see it, see both sides on her um, Facebook page if you wanna go look at it. But that's it for me guys. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. This is my first true crime video and I really, really enjoyed doing it. I already have my next case researched and ready to go. So if you guys like this kind of video, let me know and I'll go ahead and film that one and get it out to you guys. Um, but yeah, that's it for me. Thank you guys so much for watching. Stay safe. Keep your head on a swivel. Keep your eyes open. Sometimes you can't even trust your own mama. But that's it for me, guys. I'll see y'all next time. Bye. All right, so for today's episode of Fatal Attraction, the name of this episode is called What Nobody Knew. And this is January 3rd, 2013 in the Bronx. Now, I will say that when I first watched this, I don't think I'm going to be able to put the first couple of minutes of this episode into this video because it's very graphic. Um, so a neighbor who's just minding her business in her apartment hears somebody banging on her door, screaming, bloody murder, help me, somebody help me. She opens the door to find a young lady, hysterical, who has seemingly had her face blown off and she is covered in blood and eventually she falls to the ground. And so this neighbor calls 911. 911 come down and it, 911, so obviously police officers and ambulance respond to the scene. These officers come in, guns a blazing because obviously this is an active shooter situation. And the young lady who has been violently attacked, who is covered in blood dripping from her face, says that there is another victim. So that's where we are. So our victim is 22 year old Diamond Dunn. And they play clips in the 911 call and she's saying, he shot me in my face. He shot me in my face. 
Police make their way through this apartment complex, kind of clearing the building and looking for their shooter. When they make their way to Diamond's apartment, they don't find their shooter. However, they do find Diamond's mother deceased from a gunshot wound to her chest. So they give us a little bit of background on um, Diamond and her mother and everybody has amazing things to say about her. Her mother is obviously a mother of four and she is a crossing guard and I think it goes without saying that anybody with four kids is working their ass off so. For Diamond and her four siblings, that anchor was their mother, Elsina Brown. Elsina was a single mom but she was determined to give her children everything. They were her world. Employed as a crossing guard, Elzina maintained a visible profile in the neighborhood she loved. Like, usually sometimes people see a crossing guard, they don't really, oh, good morning, bye. But her, she's like, hey, how are you? Okay, make sure you guys stop, look both ways. She was just always loved. All right, so y'all know how episodes of Fatal Attractions go. They tell y'all what happened, and then they introduce a love interest. So the man that diamond is with during the time of this tragedy is a man by the name of raymond and raymond's a little bit older so raymond and diamond's relationship kind of takes off they fall in love and they're spending a lot of time together they are a boyfriend and girlfriend and because raymond i don't think i said it before he has moved to this area so he doesn't have a lot of family and friends in the area so he spends a lot of time with diamond and her family we want to stay for dinner tonight, okay? Oh, that's fine. You know, Raymond always has a place at my dinner table. As a matter of fact, I'm getting ready to start dinner, so to be ready shortly. Uh, Raymond eventually moves in with Diamond and her mother. It seemed like a storybook romance until Diamond and Raymond received some unexpected news in 2008. Raymond came to me and he said, Dad, um, I will be, uh, giving you a grandchild. But when baby Madison was born, she brought only joy to her teenaged parents. Raymond was there for the birth. Once Madison arrived, he fell in love. So they have the baby and um, after graduating high school, they move out of New York to Virginia for a more like suburban living situation. All right, so now we've jumped back to the scene of the crime and uh, even though Diamond has been shot twice in the head, they're able to get her up on a stretcher and take her to the hospital. She is still holding on. All right, so as police look at this crime scene, they're doing their thing. They realize that there's no sign of forced, forced entry into Diamond and her mother's apartment. So they assume right off the bat that um, whoever attacked them, whoever shot them is somebody that they know. All right, so as they're looking for suspects, Diamond's mom, her family members let detectives know that um, her name is Alcina, is not really liked by the community. Well, some certain people in the community. She's really liked by the kids and um, their appearance. But, but she does make an active effort as a crossing guard and um, as just a member of her community to keep the streets a little bit safer. So she was very strongly against the drug activity that was happening in her neighborhood. Um, she was not shy to call the police. She would like to have a patrol car out with her when um, she was doing her crossing guard work. So they feel as though she could have a lot of potential enemy. Obviously we're going down the suspect list and somebody offers up Raymond's name. They say that after a while of living together in Virginia that their relationship just started to deteriorate, he and Diamonds. And family tell them is intriguing. She moved here from Virginia to live with my mom a couple years ago. What happened? Relationship issues. He said that he was unfaithful to Diamond and after years of trying to make it work, one day Diamond was just done. We thought they had a good life and somewhere in between that time, everything spiraled down. Raymond was fooling around and continuously, my loving niece Diamond, overlooked it, tried to start all over again, tried to forget the infidelity over and over again. It's a little confusing at this point. At the time of the shooting, they had been separated for about two years. Diamond moved back to the Bronx first and then Raymond followed her soon after. But at this point, Raymond was living with another new girlfriend. But it said that he and Diamond still kind of had a little flirty baby daddy, baby mama, all too familiar to me situation. <laughs> Detectives knew the only way they were going to get somewhere was to find Raymond. Unfortunately, their efforts to locate Raymond come up empty from the beginning. But they are able to catch up to his girlfriend. And this is a woman by the name of Tiffany. 
So they questioned Tiffany about her relationship with Diamond, if there was any animosity, and she says no. She says that she understood that, you know, that was Raymond's baby mama. They talked or whatever, they had to talk, but she didn't like, you know, feel any kind of jealousy or anything towards Diamond, and that she was at work all day during the time of the shooting. Raymond had some criminal history, car theft, drugs, things of that sense. Next, they get some crucial news. Detectives race to the hospital, hoping their number one witness can confirm the shooter's identity. She was shot three times, grazed by the gray cigar in her hand, her shoulder, her face. Oh, that is awesome. That's crazy. Can you imagine being shot three times and still being alive to talk about it? That's like, that's crazy. And so she names Raymond as the shooter. She tells police about um, <clears throat> a history of domestic violence that took place when she lived with him in Virginia. So in the days leading up to um, the shooting, Diamond says that um, Raymond came into town on Christmas day under the guise of seeing his daughter for the holiday, but he just kind of came and stayed. He never left. And during the time that he spent in the home with her, it was just perfect. Christmas. What up, boy? Hey, hey. He came over, he stayed for about four or five days. And it was just perfect. I was like, okay, well, God, you heard my prayers. This is gonna work again. I'm finally going to be with my daughter's father. The spirit of the Christmas season moved Diamond and Raymond toward reconciliation. It felt different. It felt like we were starting over. <laughs> but this dreamscape would be short-lived. Me and Raymond made love, and then we took a nap. And the napping period, my mother must have came in and took her nap in Madison's bedroom. To Diamond's horror, less than two hours later, she awoke to see the man she just made love to standing over her with a gun. She thought he was waking her up for work. Wasn't really sure what he had, but he clicked it, and she realized as she still lay with it, it was a gun. Okay, so that is so insane. They had, they'd been spending all this time together, loving on each other, and then they have sex and they take a nap, and she wakes up to a gun on her face. That I think that's my worst fear, like spending years and years and years with somebody and then waking up one day and realizing you don't even know who you've been spending all this time with like that's scary now that diamond has named raymond as the shooter our all out manhunt sets off for him at this point it's pretty clear that raymond is on the run they think that he might be on his way to canada but they have a pretty close eye on diamond and her family she is under an alias in this hospital so just in case he tries to come back and finish the job he you know has no access for the next eight days raymond manages to stay one step ahead of his pursuers but his resources are drying up we saw may Rand was running out of him, so he got pretty desperate you know he, for a short period he came back to new york and then he went his own, on his way to uh ohio once he ran out of money he called his employer and from that they were able to pinpoint his location he called his job as if like to pick up a check as if like you like, huh? I don't, okay, whatever. Finally, on January 11th, authorities make their move. Mr. Mayran was apprehended by the U.S. Marshals in Warren, Ohio. Hey! You're Raymond Mayran. Raymond? No, that ain't me. Then who are you? Just know that he's aware that we were looking for him, that he was wanted. When confronted by officers, Raymond has no qualms about trying to lie his way out. Oh, I think I lost it before I came into the shelter. That's what I thought. Turn around, put your hands on your back. Raymond, you're under arrest. So eventually he is apprehended in Ohio. He tries to say, no, that's not me. But obviously, I mean, at this point, they cuff his ass, book him into jail, and he stands trial November 2015. Raymond gets up on the stand to say that he wasn't even there at the time of the shooting, which that's a bad defense when the person who got shot is there testifying against you. Like, come on now. Well, let's not. And the jury was able to see firsthand, you know, what he did to her. It took a great amount of courage for her to do that. 
Her testimony was powerful. She detailed the years of abuse. Raymond Myrant was convicted of second degree murder and attempted second degree murder. He was sentenced to two consecutive terms of 25 years to life. This blank stare of confusion is me trying to remember the difference between concurrently and consecutively. I do it every time I watch a true crime video. I don't get it how he just woke up one day and lost his shit. Like that is insane. So we read the comments at the end of the last video and we're going to do the same thing here. Not all of the comments, but some of them. Good for his father for not trying to make excuses for him. Some people are just monsters. Somebody said she was a teenager when she met him and for y'all to blame everything his clown ass did on her is beyond me. True, I think people forget how like, I don't know, your brain just isn't developed when you're that young. <laughs> like, the math literally does not math in my head the way it does now when I was like 16, 17. Okay, a lot of the comments on that post are really negative. Um, we're not gonna victim blame at all whatsoever, and I'm just gonna leave it at that. My Figured rather than me just regurg regurgitating information that I found from these different shows that we could kind of sit down and watch them together so that's what this video is gonna be I'm obviously still gonna be doing my makeup and I am still gonna be talking and explaining a lot of the things to you guys during this video I'm still gonna talk a lot I'm, I mean I'm still talking the majority of the video <laughs> But um, I wanted to include some of these clips from um, the episode of the show that we're going to watch together today. Um, I feel like that is better and that's more important, especially when we cover cases that involve survivors. Like, like why would I regurgitate this person's story to you when we could just hear it from them firsthand? So for today, we're going over an episode of the show Evil Lives Here. But the title of this episode is called He Lived a Double Life. And we're listening to the story of a woman named Song. Yeah. And in this episode, she's telling us the story of a past relationship she was in. All right, so she starts off by saying that she and a man named Stafford met on like a double date night. Stafford and I met uh, by mistake. A friend of mine was friends with his best friend. They wanted to go out. And so they brought us along as a wingman, I guess. A friend of hers and then a friend of his decided to go on a date, but like to kind of break the ice and to make the first date less awkward, they both bought a friend. So Sonia's friend brought her and then Stafford's friend bought him. And Sonia and Stafford ended up kind of hitting it off better than the original couple did. At the start of Sonia and Stafford's relationship, she found out that he was divorced. He had two kids and that he is a mechanic. He works for himself and he makes a pretty good living for himself. And eventually the couple start hanging out and spending more time together and they get into a relationship. She said that originally she and Stafford have a pretty good fun relationship. They make each other laugh. They had a lot of things in common and they just enjoy each other's company. But eventually she starts to notice some red flags. And she says one of the first big things that happens is one day she's over at Stafford's house and like right after his divorce, he's living with his mom. And so they're kind of hanging out at the house and while Stafford is in the laundry room washing clothes, his mother comes into the room where Sonia is and tells her, you know, you need to leave, you need to leave him alone so he can go back to his family. And of course, Sonia is taken aback by this and she picks up her shit and she's trying to get out the house. Like, you know how that is? Well, I don't know if you know how that is, but I know how that is when you're dating somebody and they're living with their mama and you get bad, like you just get weird vibes from their mama and you don't want to be there. Like, I want to be here if your mama don't want me here, but I gotta go, okay? Um, okay. Why would you say that to me? It just came out of left field. The only thing I could think was because this, the, the divorce still hadn't gone through. So I was like, okay, well maybe she just wants him to be back with the, the wife. So by the time I get to the front door, he's coming back up the stairs. Sonia. Sonia says as she's storming out of the house, Stafford comes up to her and you know, he's like, what's wrong, what's going on? And she tells him what happens. And then there's another red flag. Stafford goes to where his mother is in the house and starts 
flashing on her and being very rude and disrespectful and i want to say that when i put these clips in of um this part of the story remember if it's not coming out of sonya's mouth directly it's just a reenactment so we don't know if the things that are said in this reenactment are you know stafford's words directly so i just wanted to make that clear but sonya says she's so taken aback by this because she can't believe that he would speak to his mother that way just give me a minute. Don't go. He tells me to wait. Mom! What the hell is wrong with you? And I could hear him yelling at her. You've got no damn talking to my friend. He proceeded to continue to kind of curse her and tell her off. Get the hell out of here and mind your own damn business. This is why I don't ever do my brows on camera because they always end up doing something they ain't got no business doing. Okay, so Sonia goes on to tell us about some more red flags that happened during her relationship with Stafford. She says that after being in this relationship for a year and after she and Stafford had moved in together, he decided to unload a secret. And this secret was a bombshell. Stafford goes on to tell Sonia when he was younger, he was involved briefly with a murder case. He says that he was questioned by the police after a body was found burned alive, or I'm sorry, not burned alive, but burned in a car. He said it was the body of this man and that Stafford was questioned about it because he knew the man, but eventually after being questioned, the police decided that there just wasn't enough evidence to connect Stafford to this case. And so the case just kind of went cold and detectives stopped looking into it because they didn't have enough information. Sonia goes on to say that she later finds out that this story is a lie and that it didn't exactly happen the way Stafford had told her. Okay, so it's Editing Kennedy coming to you live from my bed in my bonnet. I'm, my voice is way worse than it was earlier, but I left a big part of this story out, so I wanted to be able to put it in for you. So when Stafford had originally told Sonia that the homicide he was involved in was with a man, that was not the case. The homicide was involving a 17 year old girl who was Stafford's girlfriend at the time. Her body was found dead and burned in this car. Stafford was their prime suspect because he was her boyfriend and because he was the last person to see her alive. They just never had enough evidence to build a case against him. But Sonia did not find out this part of the story until later. Then Sonia goes on to tell us about another incident. She said one night after having a gathering at the house she shared with Stafford, they left the home together to take home one of Sonia's cousins. And on the way to this person's house, Stafford starts taking a route that they usually, you know, didn't take. Like he's going away that they usually wouldn't go to go to this person's house. And she just asked him about it, like, hey, why are you going this way? And she says that after she asked him about it, he totally flashed out, like, don't tell me how to drive, don't tell me what to do. Totally went in on her just because she asked him a simple question. And she says that once they got home from dropping this person off, the argument continued. And he starts back up with me. I don't need you to tell me what to do. You got that? About don't question me. And it turns into this big blown out argument. I said I'm sorry. Then why you keep doing it? Leave me alone. Before I knew it, he pushed me down on the bed. He's on top of me. His face went human. I don't know if blank is the word. Sonia says that at some point during this argument, Stafford pushes her onto the bed and as they're struggling with each other, he headbutts her and totally splits her skull. But it did. Split my forehead open. I was crying and I'm just, you know, kind of hysterical because I just, I couldn't believe what had just happened. <clears throat> and she said that although she is shaken up after Stafford apologizes, she feels safe enough to stay in the home. And, um, you know, she's confident that after they talked that this kind of thing would never happen again. Now, the next thing Sonia says she notices and starts to complain to Stafford about is that his work schedule is kind of crazy. 
work schedule. Um, you know, I said it in the beginning, or maybe I didn't, but Stafford is a mechanic. He's self-employed and he's just spending a lot of time working on cars. And so she questions him about it. She's like, why are you gone all day all night she said sometimes he would even come home like what kind of cars are you working on at two o'clock in the morning but she said she questions him about it and that he just says you know he's a businessman and he's trying to make money and he just works all day and night so he can make money and he is a small town mechanic working jay-z hours <laughs> He would even miss really important events. She said one Valentine's Day, I think she said Valentine's Day 2002. He never came home. She goes on to tell us how Stafford just basically gaslights her every chance he gets. It was always her, she was always the problem. She was always the one being not understanding. What do you mean, what am I doing? I'm working. He would say, I got this car to do, I got that car to do, I'm still working on this. Oh, and then I gotta go over there and I gotta check out this person's car. He was a self-employed person. Um, he was a business owner. So there was always a, a reason. Okay, if I look a little different, I had to go outside. My mama brought me some medicine for my throat situation. She's so sweet. Sonia goes on to tell us about how Stafford just gaslights her every chance that he gets and and one day he gets up in the middle of the night storms out of the house and drives off like slamming the doors the whole shebang and so she calls him and you know she says like what's going on what's happening why'd you leave in the middle of the night and Stafford tells her that she had rolled over like on him you know how you roll over on your man rub on his chest in the middle of the night you know he said that she had done that, but started calling him another man's name. And Sonia said, you know, she didn't think that she had done it. You know, she wasn't seeing anybody else, but he had so much control over her. She started second guessing herself. She started thinking like, you know, why was she portraying herself? Why was she subconsciously like saying another man's name? You know, why was she doing this to herself? So Sonia goes on to explain to us yet another red flag that had come up during her relationship with Stafford. She says one time Stafford called her to let her know that he had cut himself really bad like on his hand in the garage and um, she was like okay well you know I'm coming like if your man is in the hospital of course you're gonna go but he's telling her you know no don't come don't come but she goes anyway. And when she gets to the hospital, Stafford and his supposed to be ex-wife are sitting together waiting in the waiting room. And so I sat down directly across from them. He didn't say anything to me. He just looked at me like he had never seen me before. And I'm looking at him like, I said, hello. The look on his face was like he was afraid to say anything. It was strange. To give him his discharge papers, he goes up and they proceed to leave out. So I walked out. I said, are you really going to act like you don't know who I am? And he was like, Sonia, go home. And so she says after sitting across from him in the waiting room and him not saying anything to her, after he's called for his discharge papers and he and his wife start to head out, she chases after him and she's calling out to him and he just says, go home, Sonia, go home. Don't, don't start nothing, just go home. <laughs> she says when she got home that day, she started packing his shit. And when um, he got home, like she didn't want to talk to him, she didn't want to hear it, but he tells her this elaborate story of their divorce not being finalized yet. So he needed her to come to the hospital to uh, bring his insurance paperwork, his insurance cards, cause she had those. Well, Sonia asked him, you know, well, so why were you hiding her? Like if she was there, why didn't you just say something? And Sonia goes on to say that she just lets it go again. She acquiesces to him and they let it go until one morning his wife shows up at their front door and Sonia says she can hear bits and pieces of the conversation and Stafford opens the door and basically tells his wife like you know what are you doing here what are you doing here when I looked out the front window it was his wife and she said oh this is your nighttime job I stood there and I was like nighttime job what is she talking about what nighttime job First thing I asked him was, what is she doing here? So she's coming to our house now? He didn't seem the least bit surprised that she was there. 
And so, of course, they have a conversation about this. Sonia is asking him, you know, like, what is she doing popping up at our house? Like, what is going on? And Dapper tells Sonia that his wife is upset because their divorce is finally finalized. And after this incident, she never showed up to their house again. So since their divorce is final, the two get engaged and they start planning a wedding, planning their lives together, planning their future. And Sonia says that they even have an engagement party. And it's after all this and when they go to set a wedding date, Stafford tells Sonia that he is not actually divorced. We had an engagement party and it was just full speed ahead with the wedding plans. And he tells me I'm not divorced. You told me the divorce was final. He sat there on the edge of the bed and he started just crying and babbling. Sonia says during this conversation, Stafford takes on the toxic man crybaby routine and he starts crying and sniffling and snotting. The water works. And he basically just goes on to say that, you know, he doesn't want to live. He wants to kill himself. And out of nowhere, he brandishes a gun and starts pointing it at himself. <clears throat> so she goes on to say that after he had, you know, been pointing the gun at himself, eventually he flipped it on her. And so she takes off running down the hall and a gunshot goes off. And as she, you know, takes a second to calm down, catch her breath, she sees a gunshot in the ceiling and she realizes, you know, that he has shot at her. And um, one thing I noticed during this, uh, you know, Sonia's interview, she talks a lot about her past self and how she feels sorry for her past self. She said that, if not those exact words, she said something very similar about her past self, but after he shot at her, she went back into the room and confronted him about it. And you gotta be one strong bitch to go back into a room after somebody done shot at you and be like, motherfucker, you just tried to shoot me. <laughs> like she talks a lot about her, you know, not necessarily being as strong as she is now. But let me tell you something, going back into a room with a weirdo with a loaded gun and confronting them is not weak bitch shit. I just had to say that because goddamn, I, I would have got out that house. Damn, I should have shaved my mustache before I filmed this. And I said, you tried to shoot me. You almost killed me. What the hell is wrong with you? And he just sat there and cried. Part of keeping me there. I went from the victim. Now, rescuing you. So after this incident, Tanya says there is another thing that happened between her. And Stafford, she says that one day, Stafford is upset because his wife had left with the kids, like left the area and he didn't necessarily know where they were. Of course, as like a great wife, Sonia or fiance, Sonia decides to go look for Stafford's kids to see maybe she can figure out where they are. And so what she does is um, she searches his wife's name. I assume she searched it in like Facebook or something to try to see like where they could possibly be. And she says she comes across an address, which had seemed to be his ex-wife's home address. And so she went there just to see if she could see any movement or activity around the house. See if she could see anybody there. Maybe they had told Stafford they were leaving, but they hadn't really left. That kind of thing. She said that when she pulled up to this address, she realized that there was a mechanic's garage on the same property as his wife's home. Sonia goes on to say that after all this time, she had never been to Stafford's garage and she figured that, you know, this must be why because his garage is on the same property as the home he shared with his wife and his kids. And so Sonia says that after putting this two and two together, she decides to pack all of his stuff and get it up out of her house. She's not doing it. She's not playing these games no more. She wants him out for good. And again, Stafford explains this away to Sonia. He says that his ex-wife or current wife or whatever, whoever she is, I don't know if the, at this point they're actually divorced or if they're still married, but um, he says that she just owns the property that his garage is on and that she doesn't live there anymore, that it's a rental property for her and she owns it, but she doesn't live there. And surprisingly, their relationship continues until yet another red flag. Sonia says she's paying their phone bill. That's one of the bills that she always paid. And um, as she's looking over it, 
you know, this is back in the day when phone bills came in the mail and it had all your, all your business on it. She said that she was looking through the phone bill and she saw a number popping up pretty frequently. Well, she saw two numbers popping up pretty frequently. One of them was his wife's number and then the other number was one that she did not recognize. And so she called this unknown number up and a woman answered the phone. And then there was another phone number that was pretty frequent. The calls are like one in the morning, really odd. So when he was sleeping, I <laughs> picked up his phone and looked through his phone. The name for the number and the name said Morgan. The woman on the phone, her name was Morgan and she says that Stafford is just her mechanic. So the next day after this incident on the phone, Sonia says that Stafford comes home upset over what had happened. Obviously he must have talked to this woman and he starts questioning her and being really aggressive towards her about, you know, like why was she calling his clients, that kind of thing. And so they get into this big full blown argument. And Sonia says that she was expecting something like this to happen. So she had taken out a kitchen knife and kind of like, you know, set it on the counter to the side. Once Stafford had noticed this, he flew off the handle and started to attacking her. She says that he was kind of like hitting her all over and eventually he takes the knife that she had had and stabs it like into the ground or into the floor of their kitchen right next to her ear, like to the side of her head. Managed to push him off of me. Something snapped in me mentally. And I got mad. I wasn't scared anymore. I was mad. He looked me square in my eye. He said, if I had a gun, I would shoot you dead right now. And I told him, I said, I do not care. I gained this strength that I hadn't had and then he started his crying he got down on his knees on the floor and begging and I just looked at him now I didn't go over to him like I normally did I didn't feel sorry for him anymore I didn't care I was done now after this incident Sonia and Stafford are done for good Sonia moves on with her life until one day she said she's leaving work and she's coming down the highway and she's headed into the gym and at some point she comes to a stop in traffic and she says out of nowhere she just gets this horrible feeling rushing down her body and her friend asks her like have you seen the news and she's like you know no and her friend goes on to tell her that Stafford had been in a car accident and he had died in this accident as well as killing two other people, a sister and a brother, in the car that he had hit, and that this accident was caused by a police chase, that Stafford had been running from the police in his car after killing a woman named Morgan and their one-year-old daughter. The man police say killed his estranged girlfriend, Morgan Rogers, and their one-year-old daughter, Leah, in their Chesterfield home Friday, then hours later killed a brother and sister in a crash on Interstate 295 while eluding police. A crash that also killed Shaw. Chesterfield police say phone records prove Shaw admitted he killed Rogers and their one-year-old daughter, Leah. So yeah, that was one hell of a story. Um, I can say when I first started looking into this case, I did not think it was gonna end that way. I'm glad Sonya made it out, okay? And I'm glad she was willing to share her story. The story may have been something that one of you guys out there needed to hear to get the courage to get out of your situation. All right guys, so that's a wrap on another true crime case here on my channel. I hope you guys enjoyed this style of video. Of course, I want y'all's feedback in the comments. Let me know what you thought of this case. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye. So we are in New York 2003 for today's case. Audrey Mabry has just moved to New York from Texas after meeting a man online and falling in love. I never mentioned it to you guys real quick. My brow pencil I use is from the beauty supply. Um, this one is actually from Amazon, but it's the same like Ruby Kisses brand from Beauty Supply. It's the only thing I use on my brows. They're like 99 cents.
Now she had just moved to New York City in October of 2003 because she had been dating a man that she met online for about six months. His name is Chris Haney. And so eventually they decided that she would move up to New York where he is because he has a really good job. He's a homicide detective up in New York and his work is very important to him. He's also older, he's 35. So he's just more further along in his career, more established than Audrey is. So it makes the most sense for Audrey to move there because at the time, Audrey's only 20 years old. So the couple move in together in an apartment in New York City and they live together very happily. And Audrey was like instantly head over heels. She said she knew from the beginning that Chris was the man that she was gonna marry and start a family with. And Audrey's only 20, but it said that she was just attracted to older men and the stability that came with dating older. And though the couple was madly in love, Audrey ended up spending a lot of time in this apartment alone because like I said, Chris was a homicide detective. So after spending a couple of lonely nights at home, Audrey decides to go out and get a job and she gets a job at, she gets a job at a Olive Garden in Brooklyn. And remember she's from Texas, so Brooklyn is a huge culture shock for her, but she settles into work and she makes friends pretty easily and gets into a routine so she's not feeling so lonely just waiting around on Chris at the house all day. So there's a guy at the restaurant named Jacob who kind of takes Audrey under his wing, looks out for her and helps her like get acclimated. It seems to Audrey that he wants to be like more than a friend, but obviously she doesn't explore that because she's in a committed relationship at the time. But she's very appreciative of Jacob's friendship. But Audrey's settling in at work. She's settling in into her home. One night Chris comes home and tells Audrey that he has to tell her something really important. And she's like, what is it? And he tells her that he lied about his age, that he's not 35, he is 38. But by this time, they've been together for a year and a half and Audrey doesn't mind. She says, you know, it's just three years, who really cares? I care, that's deception, manipulation. And then on top of that, after she says she's fine with the age difference, he gets down on one knee and proposes to her, which seems so loaded, but whatever. And then shortly after proposing, they find out that they are pregnant and expecting their first child. So what they decide to do is move down to Florida because Audrey's just always wanted to move to Florida. She said growing up, she always knew that she wanted to like settle down and raise a family in, did I say California? In Florida. That was just like her dream, her dream life. So Chris obliges and he buys her a home in Florida. However, Chris has just a few more months left in the police service situation before he can retire. So they decide for Audrey to live down in Florida on her own and get settled into the home while Chris finishes out his, I wanna say stint in the military, but that's not what it is, his time on the police force, I don't know, chair. I don't know. So that, you know, he gets all the benefits of his retirement. And she also transfers to another Olive Garden in Florida so she can work as she's, you know, preparing for the baby. But when she gets down to Florida, her coworker, Jacob, the one that was being friendly with her, he had also transferred down to the Olive Garden in Florida. Now she knew nothing about this, but he said that he just had family in Tampa and you know, he decided to move and it was just a total big coincidence. But it ends up working out in Audrey's favor because Jacob is able to be there and help her as her husband, you know, is still in New York. And Jacob helps her with just like around the house things, mowing the grass, that sort of thing. You know, the things you wouldn't want to see a pregnant woman do. Like I really hate when I'm out in the world <clears throat> and I see a pregnant woman struggling with something, like when I see pregnant people, I just wanna help them do everything. Do you need me to carry you? Do you need me to put you on my back? I'll push your grocery basket for you. I'll help you load your groceries in the car. You about to go check your mail. Let me go check your mail for you. Like I hate to see pregnant women move. I feel like when you get pregnant, all you should have to do is be pregnant. You shouldn't have to do nothing else. You shouldn't have to do nothing else. 
But Jacob's able to help her out. And um, she's not totally alone. Chris visits as much as he can. So Audrey finds herself once again getting settled in a new area. She's working at the Olive Garden in Florida until she finally has their son. She has a baby boy. And so obviously that brings Chris down to Florida and they're in like that newborn bliss. And then Chris's family comes to visit as well. Chris's brother and his brother's wife come to Florida to visit the family to meet Audrey and the new baby boy. And I feel like shit always pops off when your family comes to town, especially if you <laughs> like don't see your family very often. So the four of them are just talking, Chris and Audrey and his brother and his brother's wife. So the boys pull away to go do their own thing and then it's Audrey and Chris's sister-in-law. And they were just chatting it up and Audrey mentions that, you know, they are engaged, that they got engaged before the baby and that they're finally, you know, ready to get married. So Chris's sister-in-law is like, well, that must mean his divorce is final. Like he finally was able to finalize the divorce, like asking Audrey. But Audrey had no idea what the fuck she was talking about. But Audrey kind of plays it off and plays along. She doesn't want to be like embarrassed, like to say she doesn't know what the hell this lady is talking about. So she's holding it in until company's gone. But she feels extremely betrayed because she made the decision to have kids with him, to move into him, to buy a house with him in Florida, thinking that this man was a single Pringle the whole time. He is potentially married or in the process of getting a divorce either way she had no idea so she confronts him about it later on and he tells her well you know he didn't want to bring it up that he was never going to bring it up to her because it was just a marriage you know on paper that they haven't that they hadn't been together for a long long time and he was scared that if he had mentioned it to her that she would leave him so she just so he decided to just hide this from her which is why yo wild as fuck what would you do in that situation like if you found out you had a baby with somebody you moved in with him moved from texas to new york to florida just to find out that he was married what would you do you guys i would lose my marbles like at the very least let me choose whether or not i want to be the other woman give me the choice okay don't just have me out here looking bad but Audrey reacts from a place of understanding. She understands how he must have been afraid to tell her about the whole marriage thing and the divorce. So she lets it go and they move on. And so she forgives him, but her friends and family are like, bitch, I don't know, I don't know. Cause they feel like, okay, well he lied about his age. He lied about being married. What else? Is he lying about and do you feel like you can really trust him? And that's the thing. That's why we be hiding a lot of stuff because we know in our heads deep down that the shit we be putting up with don't make no sense. Like one, And then once you tell your people, once you tell your mama, your daddy, your sister, your brother, they're going to make you feel like, okay, bitch, you, you're making some irrational decisions. You need to come back down to earth. And nobody wants to hear that. Nobody wants to hear that they're delusional out loud. And then remember, she's so much younger than Chris, so there's probably a whole lot of emotional manipulation going on that she's not even old enough to realize at the time. And she sticks beside her man. And it seems like it's just one problem after the next in the household. Finally, when the baby is six months old, Chris is able to move down to Florida full time. And he does so, but it ends up being a problem how much Jacob had been helping out Audrey in Chris's absence. Yeah, Chris is not super excited about how Jacob has been helping out around the house. He tells him he don't need him to cut the grass. And he feels like Jacob and Audrey have been quote unquote playing house. And you know that he was the man of the house and he was back and he didn't need Jacob's help anymore that was another source of like stress and tension within the household imagine somebody being nice enough out of the kindness of their heart to help out your pregnant wife while you in new york being undercover brother and you come back mad about the help anyway ciao but they go through a little bit of growing pains and they settle back down finally and in 2009 Audrey decides to go back to school and start doing things that fulfilled her as a person and not just like mom things. So Chris gets a job doing security and Audrey is focusing on her schoolwork and taking care of the baby boy. And while she's in school and doing really well in school, she says she feels supported 
but at the same time she always felt like he wanted her to do well but not better than him like she he wanted her to do whatever she wanted to do but he kept a huge emphasis on like the kids being her main priority and her being a mom first before anything and as they finally settle into once again a new routine audrey is in school and chris is working security there is another bump in their road so it's a regular regular night and chris comes home from work and they're just catching up you know as couples do at the end of the work day and she says okay well get settled in dinner's almost ready but he says that he has already eaten and audrey said on this night in particular she just had a dying urge to go through his phone so while he's in the shower getting fresh from work she goes through his phone and there was a thank you for dinner so glad we got to spend some time together type of text message in his phone so when she gets so when he gets out of the shower she obviously confronts him about it and he says you know it's not like that i'm not cheating on you blah 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 but they have a big blow up fight and Arda decides that there's just been too much deception so she packs up her son and they go stay with a friend of hers and she's and Chris is very upset about her taking their son but Audrey goes to stay with her friend for a few days before Chris pops up at her friend's house unannounced and he promises her that he never really cheated on her he says that it was like an after work dinner with co-workers but everybody flaked but he and another woman and it was just a coincidence that it was just the two of them and that he didn't want to mention it because he didn't want it to sound bad you know so that's why he omitted the truth he begs for her back and he says you know that they can't break up because they have a son and he also tells her that his divorce is finally finalized so they can finally get married and have another baby which is everything rg wanted to hear that's what she's been waiting for this whole time and so that is exactly what they do they get pregnant right away they get married right away and then there's another bump in their road did you see it coming did you see it coming okay so so audrey gets a call from the bank about a really big loan and she's like i don't know nothing about this loan and so she's like okay well let me ask my husband and this is where he drops a bomb on her that he has a very severe gambling problem he gambled away all their bill money their his pension all of that the money was gone he went through all of it and then he went out and took out loans and instead of using those loans to pay back the money he had spent he used those loans and went out gambling some more yeah mm -hmm. severe gambling addiction all their bills were past due they were between a rock and a hard place and audrey had no idea so here she is thinking that she had everything that she finally wanted they had another son they're living in a house they got married his other divorce his divorce or whatever the fuck was finalized you know she finally thinks that they've got it figured out and that just all comes crashing down and this is the final straw okay she decides that she's gonna move out get a divorce all of that all of that all of that okay she's done with his ass but she isn't financially in the place to move out so they decide so they come up with an agreement from september to december she's gonna go back to work and get up the money to get her own place and then in december when she had her coins together she would move out with the boys and go about her business girl start her own life now we're coming to the morning of november 17th 2009 on this morning in particular remember audrey's still in school she's working she's doing a thousand things girl trying to put herself in a better situation for she and her two boys so she gets up early that morning to take the kids to daycare because she has to give a speech at school okay so she takes the kids to daycare and then she goes out for a quick run to like clear her head and like shake off some of the anxiety she was having about the speech she had to give for school that day so she runs into a neighbor and they have a quick little chat before audrey finishes her run 
and heads back home. It was a quick run. She says she goes for quick runs all the time. Her neighborhood was relatively super safe. She didn't lock the door. She just ran out the front door and run back in. So after her run, she makes her way back inside the home and she finds Chris inside the home, booty butt naked, wielding a knife. And she can tell by the look in his eye that he's just, he's up to no good, that she's definitely in danger, but she's kind of just like paralyzed in fear. And they're staring at each other before he starts attacking her with this knife and he slices her in the hand she falls back onto the floor and so he's holding a picture of their son and he's like who's his dad who's his real dad who's his real dad and she's like you like what are you talking about and he just keeps asking her who's his real dad who's his real dad tweaking the fuck out okay he picks her up off the ground still wielding this knife and ushers her into the garage where he has some stuff set up. He has a blanket laid out on the floor that he puts her on. He has the knife and a hammer laid out as well as a candle and gasoline. So he switches from the knife to a hammer and starts attacking her with this hammer. After beating her with the hammer, he picks up the gasoline and starts pouring pouring it on her and starts pouring it on her before setting her on fire in their garage. And so he lights her on fire and then lights the whole house on fire. Audrey is luckily able to open the garage on, while she's literally on fire. She opens the garage and she's calling for help, calling for help. The neighbor that she had spoken to before her run that she bumped into sees her and she runs across the street. She pulls her jacket off and she's able to extinguish the flames that Audrey's literally covered in. So she puts out the fire that's on Audrey and she calls 911 and they're able to take Audrey away in an ambulance. She has burns over 90% of her body. And when firefighters and police arrive, they also find Chris in the backyard with a few minor burns, but nothing compared to what Audrey has suffered. Audrey is in a coma and though they're not sure if she's going, and I think because they're not sure if she's going to recover, Chris takes this opportunity to sit up in the hospital and lie to detectives. He tells detectives that Audrey was the one trying to kill him. He said that Audrey and her boyfriend attacked him trying to kill him. He said he came home and they were both there and like jumped him, beat him up before setting the house on fire. Even though Audrey's the one in the in the coma girl. So they're very confused, especially because the uh, condition that Audrey's in, like she had burns on the inside because she had swallowed gasoline. Like he, she's obviously the victim here. But they suspect Chris from the jump from the get go. And he also had sent like a weird text message to his friends and family, kind of like admitting to what he was about to do, saying that he's gonna be the monster that she always painted him out to be. So after this, police are like, okay, this is our guy, and he's arrested at the hospital. But Audrey is able to make a full recovery and she's able to obviously give her account of what happened. And she says, she says that during like everything that was happening to her, she thought she was going to die. She started saying her prayers and asking the Lord for forgiveness. And then she said she had a vision, a flash of her children growing up to be orphans, that they didn't have either of their parents. And she said in that vision, she found the strength to just hold on until she got to the hospital. And luckily she is here today to be a mother to her children. Chris is convicted and sentenced to a lifetime prison sentence, as he should be. I'm gonna insert a clip from Audrey because I thought her words were really nice. Because I survived what happened to me, I felt like it was my responsibility to do everything in my power to make sure that this didn't happen to anyone else. I really am coming to a point in my advocacy work where I am focusing on prevention. Let's learn what domestic violence is. Uh, let's learn what healthy relationships are. In about two months, I am marrying the man of my dreams. And it's not just my excitement that excites me. It's the look in my son's eyes when they see the two of us together. When you almost die, but then survive, 
you are given the most beautiful gift. And that gift that is given to you is a little something called perspective. And so I feel so grateful, not only to be alive, but just to experience life every day. And you guys, for today's case, we are in Atlanta. And this case revolves around Sarah and Fred Tokar. They are a married couple living in Atlanta in the 1980s. So Sarah and Fred connect in Atlanta because they're both from Buffalo, New York. That is where they both grew up. They ended up in Atlanta for different reasons. Sarah after a divorce and Fred was pursuing a legal career. He was actually the assistant district attorney at the time when the two of them started dating and that's how Sarah found him. She saw him on TV but she had already kind of known him because back in New York one of Sarah's sisters dated Fred's brother. So when she saw him on TV she called him up and they hit it off. And like I said this was Sarah's second marriage and she put her all into this marriage because her first marriage ended shortly after they got married and it wasn't like it was just something that one big thing that happened that ended their relationship they just weren't as compatible as they thought they would be and it was super disappointing so this marriage was like her Hail Mary she didn't want to feel like a disappointment she didn't have kids in this first marriage and she came from a very big big family she was one of seven sisters which I cannot imagine being the mother in that household I would love to have a daughter but seven of them but super extremely well-off family. They all went to private school. Her father was a surgeon. Keep that in the back of your mind that her father is a surgeon because we're gonna roll back around to that once we get into the nitty gritty. But I say all this to say in her second marriage, Sarah kind of had a point to prove. She wanted to prove to herself and to her family, mostly to her father, that she could have a stable relationship, that she could get married, have a family, the whole shebang. Her career was popping and it's very cool to me. She was like basically a club promoter in Atlanta, hosting events in clubs, very bougie, very upscale, and then working the room, making sure everybody had a good time. Like, tell me that's not like the plot of a sitcom like sex in the city but she lives in atlanta and she's a club promoter and she hosts part like that is so cool to me and sarah and fred meshed together very well they were both like that light of the room bright personality the star of the show like everybody knew them gravitated towards them everybody loved them they were like people's people i guess i should probably do my makeup huh um but the couple they only date for a little while not even a full year before fred and sarah winds up getting married they wed in july of 1985. they moved to cobb county you know like 30 minutes outside of atlanta but fred is still working downtown and fred was very ambitious constantly reaching for more you know district attorney was cool and everything but he wanted more. So Fred leaves the courthouse and decides to open his own law firm doing like big corporate law. And he started to make the big, big bucks because he was really good at his job, okay? And then as well as doing the private practice, Fred some kind of way ended up being a part-time judge, which I did not know was a thing literally in all my true crime life, have never heard of that before. But basically he was appointed as a judge part-time by a mayor. So he was also making pretty decent money doing that. And I will say Fred definitely turns out to be a real piece of shit. That's why we hear it. Y'all know it's true. It's a true crime. It's a true crime video. But I love a man with more than one job. You better go to work. You better go to work. And while Fred is going to work and you know, making sure home is taken care of, Sarah is having babies. I think I said before that she didn't have any kids 
in the previous marriage i'm pretty sure i told y'all that but she does have two sons for fred and Fred just kept growing and growing. He eventually starts representing athletes. He has, you know, partners working for him at the law firm. Baby, he is, took a small business and really turned it on its head. He's making a pretty chunk of change. And while, you know, they were happy and doing well financially, Sarah's family didn't really love Fred. You know, they said he was like the arrogant type he only talked about himself and his accomplishments, you know, very much like a one-way conversation. Fred talking about Fred and how awesome Fred is, which y'all know I used to bartend at Hooters. I worked at Hooters for a long time. I met so many Freds in my lifetime, girl. And because he was so busy with like his law firm and all of that, he wasn't home a lot, which makes sense. And Sarah didn't complain, so her family didn't complain, complain you know. It was what it was. She was a stay-at-home mom and he was the busy lawyer. But it also got to the point where outside of like corporate law and handling celebrities and athletes, he started to defend and work for mm, maybe some drug dealers, some not the best people, which I feel like everybody is entitled to a good lawyer. And if you're selling so many drugs that you can afford a nice lawyer, more power to you. I mean, I, who am I? And you know, Sarah didn't necessarily like this because she worried about, you know, unhappy clients retaliating. Y'all seen Diary of a Mad Black Woman. Y'all already know how that went down. You know, so she was wondering if they were safe in their home and if Fred was safe, you know, going to work every day. And there was an instance where their son found a gun in the car. And it's obviously extremely alarming to her because can you imagine not even knowing that your husband owns a gun but then your three-year-old finds it you got your three-year-old with a gun that would freak me out i hate guns but i'll shoot you don't try me. and the gun situation is very alarming to her because like i said she didn't even know she had it so she felt as though you know you are so worried about yourself that you got this secret gun in your car that you didn't even tell me about what else do I know about? What are you afraid of? And should I be scared too? But he like brushed it off, doesn't make it a big deal. And he isn't considerate of her feelings. And she does not like this. Sarah does not like this. And she tells him that she wants a divorce. And so she says she wants a divorce. Like she doesn't like this sneaky feeling. Everything feels wrong. She wants a divorce. Fred like whatever. You can't divorce me i've got all the money you're a stay-at-home mom like what are you gonna do and so after this things in the household get really abusive to say the least i mean he wasn't physically abusive that we know of but he started keeping the purse strings really tight like sarah would have to ask him for money to go grocery shopping to buy things for the boys like little shit that they needed like and he would give her the bare minimum. Like she was a struggling single mom married to a hotshot attorney because he was not giving her the money she needed so that she couldn't afford to leave him. I mean, even with going to the doctor for co for copays, he held it super tight. He was being a dick. Not only was he keeping the money tight, but he started not coming home. Sarah started to get calls to the home from unknown numbers if she would answer the phone the person would hang up right away so she wondered if he was having an affair so what she decides to do is hire a private attorney the girl a private investigator please i told y'all my brain is turned off but we thugging it out she pri she hires a private attorney I said it again, she hires a private detective to follow Fred. Fred is turning out to be such a sneaky, shysty guy. He realizes that a private detective is following him. He follows Fred to this like secret apartment complex. That's not super, well not secret apartment complex. The apartment complex wasn't a secret. Fred having this apartment was a secret. The private detective follows him there and he realizes that after Fred went inside this apartment, Fred was pulling back the curtains and looking at him like Fred knew he was there and he says after Fred spotted him 
a police car pulled up next to him and asked him what he was doing there and that he needed to leave. So Fred had called one of his police friends on the private detective. And even though the private detective, he gets made and he realizes that Fred got too many connections for him to be involved in this. Like he doesn't want anything to blow back, fall back on him. So the private detective says, you know, I can't do this for you anymore. But he does prove that Fred is having an affair. And because of this, Sarah asks for a divorce again. And he says no again. But she did not give up, okay? She was not trying to be trapped in this situation that she didn't want to be trapped in. So she decides to do some investigation of her own. And so what she does is that she goes down to the basement where Fred keeps this safe. And she, you know, is wondering what's in this safe, why they never talk about it. And so she's able to crack the code for the safe. And she finds out that Fred has all these offshore foreign bank accounts with big money in them, okay? So he's got all of this money, I mean hundreds of thousands of dollars in these offshore foreign bank accounts. Meanwhile, she clipping out box tops to get cereal at the store. And that would have been enough for me, baby. We would have been fighting in the front yard, tearing it down. So she goes back to the private investigator with this paperwork, with these bank statements, all of that. And while the private investigator definitely washed his hands because he don't want to get caught up in no nothing, he tells her, yeah, whatever this is, all the way illegal. It ain't right. It's wrong. Jail. Prison. She sits on this information. She doesn't take it to the police because she feels like she can't trust them, first of all. Um, and she just waits for an out. But unfortunately, Sarah never got the opportunity to leave. So November 29th, 1992, Sarah and the boys had went home to visit her family for the Thanksgiving holiday. The 29th was their first day back. On the 28th, Fred had left the home to travel to Alabama because he needed to talk to a, a um, client who was incarcerated in Alabama. So when Sarah and the boys make it back home and they're pulling into their garage, the unthinkable happens. They made it home into the garage. Sarah's corralling the boys and trying to get them inside. Once they unlock the door to get inside, there's someone in the home and this person forces them back into the car at gunpoint and forces Sarah to keep driving. So they're driving down the road. It's dark, it's late at night, and the gunman is in the passenger seat. The boys are in the back seat, and Sarah is driving. The gunman tells Sarah to make a turn, and she decides not to make this turn, and this sets the gunman off. He shoots her from the passenger seat, and he flees leaving Sarah slumped over in the driver's seat and her two sons in the back seat. At this point, Sarah is still alive. Her sons try to like wake her up to shake her up a little bit, but they don't get any kind of response from Sarah. So her kids get out of the car and they go to the nearest house and knock on the door. So immediately there's cops, there's ambulance everywhere. CPS comes out. The kids are given to the nearest relative which is one of Fred's brothers and um, unfortunately Sarah does not survive her injuries and the kids are with Fred's brother until Fred returns from Alabama. So originally once they looked at the house there's jewelry pulled out things missing from the home. They think it's a burglary, bur bur wow, burglary gone wrong but I already told y'all that Fred is a piece of but the extent of his pizza shitness, just wait on it. So first things first, when Fred makes it back to Atlanta, he has to go in to talk to the police immediately. And he's crying, boo-hooing, saying that he just wants to see his wife. Let me see her, let me see my wife. Oh my God, I can't believe I wasn't there. My little boys, my babies were there. I can't believe my kids were there without me. 
having a fit in this interrogation room, okay? So at this point, detectives have no reason to sus suspect Fred. He's a lawman, he's a big hotshot attorney, and the person who attacked Sarah and the boys was black. So, you know, blame it on the intrusive of thoughts we're gonna win today, and they definitely are, but you know, they figured it was a random black person and it could have in no way be tied to Fred. They have this big gigantic funeral. It's all on the news. Y'all know Fred is the form is a former assistant DA. He's a big lawyer, so it's a big deal. This funeral is huge. But the boys don't attend. Her sons, they don't go. Um, they want to spare the kids, you know, being at the funeral, so the kids do not attend. But detectives don't really have anywhere to go. They don't know who their suspect is and they don't know where to start. And so they go back to talk to the family again and the family says like yeah it might have been a burglary but fred still all still has all of his nice like if the home was burglarized and some things were taken why didn't fred lose like the best of the best of his stuff and how would the person who burglarized the home know what to take and what not to take the family also says that, you know, he represented some shady people and one of Sarah's biggest fears was one of those people coming after her and the kids. And so they bring Fred back in to talk again. And so they ask him, you know, is there anybody you have in mind of like anyone that would have wanted to do something like this? And Fred goes nuts. Fred starts listing all of the people that he had like not the best rapport with, clients, associates, other lawyers, police officers, boom, 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 boom. letting the police hear it all, okay? People that he worked with that had people killed. Like, I mean, snitching. Gunna and thug, like, I don't know what's going on, but he is snitching. Also, one of Sarah's sisters had the financial paperwork. Sarah had made copies of all of it before anything had happened to her and gave it to her sister, you know, as like an insurance policy after her death. If anything happens to me, take this shit to the police. And that's what her sister did. Regular police in Atlanta can't deal with this. Once you cross state lines, all of that, the FBI gets involved. So they reach out to the FBI and they find out that the FBI has already been looking into Fred because Fred has been on his James St. Patrick laundering money through nightclubs. But he wasn't like personally laundering the money. What he was doing was he was representing these criminals, representing these drug dealers and he would set up the businesses for them, set up the nightclubs, set up how they would launder their money, get you know everything going for them, and then collect his little piece of change. Teaching them the game, teaching them how to clean their money, wash their money. Is that the term, wash the money? Wash the money. I watched all of power, so I know the term. So this is good, detectives are happy to hear this, but obviously like money laundering, all of that is not the same as a murder charge, okay? So they still need to ramp up the investigation. They figure since he's dealing with criminals, the only thing that talks on the streets is money. Money talks, so they set up a $50,000 reward for anybody who has any type of information that could crack this case open. They know all they need is one good snitch. And girl, it be your own people because the gunman's sister to collect her 50k and i got a brother baby i love my brother i don't know if i would trade his life for 50k i really don't know i really don't think i would 50k for my brother my blood cold cold she says hello yeah mm -hmm, my brother was a shooter and i would like my money in all hundreds so this woman's name the sister's name is tuesday but it's not spelled tuesday it's spelled t-o-o-z-e-d-a-e -E. she said her brother curtis was the shooter this is an address where you can find him this is his criminal history and curtis at the time was only 23 but he had previous run-ins with the law so they go whip down on curtis he's kind of the type of guy that didn't have a permanent residence he was just kind of couch hopping they find him under a bed at somebody's house drag him from up under that bed before he decides to talk to the police he asks for a phone call to his mother and um, the detectives oblige. He gets on the phone 
with his mother and his mother tells him do not get in there and make a fool out of me tell the truth do the right thing you know act like at some point i raised you cor correctly um tell the truth but he doesn't tell detectives exactly but his friend eddie lawrence is the person okay eddie lawrence knew fred because fred and eddie had worked together eddie was a con man he wrote bad checks he started different businesses promising people he was going to do work for them taking his little deposit running off on the plug so fred represented him in that and then after that the two of them went into business together and basically eddie did the same thing that fred was representing him for to fred and he ended up owing fred about hundred and fifty thousand dollars which how fred got got like that is crazy to me when he wasn't even giving this lady no money to go to the damn grocery store so they bring Eddie Lawrence in for questioning. So since Eddie and Curtis don't really get them anywhere, but they know that they're involved, they decide to shake the table. The detectives decide to shake the table. And what they do is they hold a press conference in um, you know, the word of Sarah's murder that they finally arrested two suspects. It was a big thing. It was all on the news. They finally got to suspects woo not only did they release the fact that they had two suspects they said that these two suspects were acquaintances business partners well known by fred tokars and it just so happens that when this whole news conference press conference thing was released fred the boys and sarah's family were all together in florida and so when this news came out everybody looking at fred like what your business partners got to do with this? What you mean? What you talking about? What's going on? And Fred brushes it off. He says, oh no, the police have it all wrong. There's no way that these two men are involved. And so Sarah's family is like, well, what is your all's business dealings? Like what kind of business you doing with them? What's really going on? But Fred shrugs it off. So they all separate that day and the next day they're supposed to all get together to take the boys to Bush Gardens to try to, you know, cheer the kids up. When the family goes to pick up Fred and the boys, Fred says the boys can go, but he doesn't really feel like going. He's going to stay at the hotel. So obviously her family thinks this is a little weird, but it's not about him. It's about the kids. So they take the kids to Bush Garden, but when it's time to take them back, Fred is MIA, not answering the phone, not answering the door at the hotel. And so the family calls 911, police come and bust the door down, child. So when they bust the door down, this fool was laid out on the bed unconscious because he tried to, you know what I'm saying? But Sarah's father literally climbs on the bed and gives this man CPR until the ambulance arrives and they take his ass to the hospital and he survives he had also left a suicide note saying that he couldn't deal with everything that was going on in his life currently but after this after he gets out of the hospital child detectives are like we need to talk to this motherfucker again and you know their biggest thing is when you came into the interrogation room the second time you were giving us this long list of all your clients all your associates everybody who had bad business dealings who would want to do something to you but you never mentioned the man who owed you a hundred thousand dollars and we just think that's kind of funny and so fred says well you never asked and i'm sorry if you sit across from me and i'm asking you about something pertaining to a murder and you say well you never asked stop playing with me i don't know how detectives don't be hitting people because yeah. So detectives still at this point don't have enough to link Fred to any of the anything that's going on. But Fred decides to give his own press conference. As he was being investigated, Tokars proclaimed his innocence. The scrutiny and its impact on me and my family has made a normal lifestyle impossible. So they got to break down Fred some more. And so they decided to look into, ooh, 
girl. They decide to look into his Alabama alibi. So they go to talk to the person who was in police custody in Alabama that Fred went to go visit. Luckily, this man is honest and forthcoming with information. And he says, honestly, I didn't even know Fred was coming up here. When I walked into the little thing to talk on the phone and saw him, I was shocked. I was confused. I didn't know it was gonna be Fred. He said that Fred stopped by for a few minutes, asked him how he was doing, how he was holding up, and left. They didn't discuss his case or anything. Which is so crazy to me, because if you're gonna go far enough to drive all the way to Alabama to set up an alibi, why not just finish it out? Why not talk to this man about his case? Like, that is so lazy. You're using him as an alibi for murder, but you don't even wanna talk? Did you think it through at all? So that's one thing. They also find out that Fred had almost $2 million worth of life insurance policies taken out, taken out on Sarah. And so nobody's talking. And then y'all know Fred is a criminal defense attorney. He is not about to snitch on himself. They bring him in for questioning a couple more times, but unfortunately they don't even have enough to arrest him for eight months. He just chilling. But what happens is things start to fall back on Eddie because Eddie is unsure of like what his chances in court will be. He felt like Fred was gonna get off, but he wasn't. And so he starts to talk to work out a deal so he don't have to go to jail for life or possibly even face the death penalty. So Eddie starts to talk. So he agrees to testify in court against Fred and to bring enough information to the court so that they could finally arrest him. Can you tell us about the uh, murder of Sarah Tokars? Did Fred Tokars hire you to uh, kill his wife? He said the first time Fred approached him about killing his wife was in the summer of 1992. So Curtis ends up being the gunman. Fred outsourced the murder to Eddie and then Eddie outsourced to Curtis, okay? Because Fred didn't really want to do it because he was doing it in the sense of paying back a debt, like Fred didn't offer him any money, Eddie was just doing it because he owed Fred money, if that makes sense. So they're finally able to arrest Fred. They arrest him at the home with the kids, but they like pull out all the stops. They don't want him to freak out, try to himself or do anything to the boys. So it's, the, it's flooded. Cops, SWAT, FBI, they make it a mission to get in, get out and get the boys out safely and get them back to Sarah's family. And that's exactly what they do. So all three of them go to trials. And so all three of them are found guilty. Curtis, because he did not want to talk outside of implicating Eddie, is sentenced to life without the possibility of parole, but no death penalty. Eddie Lawrence was sentenced to life with the possibility of parole. Fred is also sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. He is too jurors shy of the death penalty. Everybody else wanted him out of here. So in 20, but in 2020, Fred Tokars died in prison. I wonder if it was COVID. It said natural causes. Um, he had a degenerative disease that his mind was gone. He hadn't walked. He'd been in a wheelchair for the past 10 years he was in prison so they said he died of natural causes but he didn't have a tough time in prison um, before he got sick he was put into like protective custody within the prison he was um, secluded from the rest of the population because of what he did for a living he wasn't even listed on the prison roster they had him undercover in a prison in Pennsylvania because he died in prison so recently, there's a lot of um, news coverage about it on YouTube if you wanna check that out. There's also the kids' testimonies and talking to the police and stuff like that on YouTube. I'm personally not trying to watch that. Y'all know I'm a crybaby, I can't do stuff like that, but it's on YouTube if you wanna go watch it. Um, just search Fred Tokar's name and a bunch of stuff will pop up for you. The only thing I wonder if like leaving the kids in an abandoned car with their mother in the front seat, I wonder if that was a part of the plan or if they even had a plan, but if so, electric chair, like that is the worst thing to think about. They were so young. So it is January 17, 2010. Samuel Johnson Sr. and his wife, Stephanie Johnson, are looking for their son, Samuel Jr.
Samuel Jr. was one of the couple's three kids and no one had heard from him for about a week. So on the morning of the 17th, they go to the police station to report him missing. This was concerning to his family because Sam was said to be a very reliable, responsible young man. He was 26 years old at the time and he was a father to a son whose life he was very much present in. His son is 18 months old. He and the mother are no longer together, but he's taking care of his son. He's working very hard. He's got two jobs. He works at a middle school as like, it was called a safety officer. Not exactly sure what that means, but, but he also had just started driving buses for the city. So he was working two jobs and trying really hard to provide for his family. So it was unlike him to fall off the grid. Sam was also newly engaged to a woman he dated before he dated his son's mother. They had rekindled their relationship and were moving pretty quickly. And this woman was also pregnant. And she also had not heard from him. So of course, this is very alarming to his family. He wouldn't just fall off the face of the earth like that. So his family, like I said, report him missing. And with a new baby on the way, a new relationship, a new fiance, Sam was on the verge of getting his life back together, which he really had been working hard to do because in March of the previous year, when he was still with the mother of his son, they were living together in a home and this home burnt down. There was a fire while nobody was home, so nobody was hurt, but they lost everything. And this was hard for them to bounce back on because they were only relying on Sam's income. His baby mother, Vanessa, she didn't work and Sam didn't want her to. He wanted to be able to take care of home on his own. But when the house burnt down, it was a huge blow to the family and ultimately led to the end of their relationship. Friends and family said that Sam was very depressed during this time because all he was doing was working and coming home and sleeping. He wasn't, you know, he didn't have much time to do anything else because he was trying to make as much money as he possibly could. And so at this point, now that he's working two jobs, he and his new fiance are actually about to get their own apartment together to welcome their new baby. So it was highly unlikely that Sam would just fall off the face of the earth at this time. Like I said, his new fiance had not heard from him. His parents also reached out to Vanessa to see if she had heard from him, but she had not heard from him as well. She said she had been calling him and that their 18 month old son had been leaving voicemails on his phone, but she hadn't been able to get in touch with him either. Luckily, Sam's missing persons report is taken pretty seriously. The officer who is there when his parents go to report him missing actually knew Sam from his time working as a safety officer in the middle school. So he takes it very seriously and they start looking into it. They question his friends and family to see who had heard from him. His father said the last time he had seen Sam, Sam was telling his father that Vanessa was going out of town with the baby and that when she came back, they had a lot of talking to do. There was something big that they needed to talk about. Sam also told his father that he was expecting some important paperwork in the mail and to look out for it for him. Sam's father said that his son was not in a weird headspace. He was happy, he was jovial, and you know, didn't seem like the type of person that was about to fall off the face of the earth, you know? So Sam's parents file the police report and then they leave the police department to just go around the city and see if they can see Sam's car, to see if they can find anything out of the ordinary. They're just keeping their eyes out. So they drive around for a while before making their way back home. When they return back to their home, there is a policeman's card on their front door, tucked into the front door. So they take the card and they call the number back and the detective on the other end of the phone tells them that a body was found and that they had come to the home to let them know that this body was their son. It was Sam Jr. 
So let's get into how the body was found. Sam was found in the cemetery by someone who was in town on vacation just visiting San Antonio. This man was on a walk and he passed the cemetery and he could kind of see that there was someone laying kind of near the entrance of the cemetery. He assumed this person was sleeping and he thought it was like a homeless person just taking a nap you know, for a few hours. So he did not disturb this person. He minded his business. He kept on with his walk. But he was walking for a while. When he made the loop back around, he passed the cemetery again, and he realized that the person was still there in the same exact position it was before. So this is when he decided to approach and he realized that, you know, this was not someone sleeping, but it was a dead body. This person had been several times before being dumped here they didn't think this is where the crime had taken place because there was no blood at the cemetery no shell casings it was just the body sam's body obviously matched the description of the missing persons report his parents had filed just a few hours earlier and it's confirmed to be Sam because apparently in San Antonio, you have to give your fingerprints when you go to get a driver's license. I didn't know that. So they are able to confirm his identity through his fingerprints before alerting his family that a body was found. So they identify him right away. Upon further examination, they realized that Sam had been several times, but he was the execution style. They know he was on his knees at the time he was shot because there was a gun wound through his chin that went directly through his chest. So he was probably on his knees with his head down. It is raining again. I don't know if y'all can hear me over the sound of the rain. I'm sorry. But so this obviously picks up the investigation. It's no longer a missing person investigation. It's a murder. So of course they want to talk to Sam's fiance. Her name is Erica. Remember she's pregnant at the time, but this is news to everybody. Nobody knew before the investigation started. So Erica is interviewed by detectives. And Erica tells them that she hadn't seen Sam since the 13th. And he was headed out to Vanessa's home. Remember I told you the home that he and Vanessa shared about 10 months prior to his disappearance had burned down, he was going to her house to collect his portion of the insurance payout, which was only $340. We'll get into that, cause bitch. Yeah, $340, but he needed this money so he could get together with Erica and they could put down their deposit on their new apartment. So he was eager to go collect his money so he and his new boo could get their apartment. And you know, he was eager to get Erica settled into a new space so they could start welcoming their baby and getting things together in the new apartment, which is so cute. But that was the last time that Erica had seen Sam. And while Sam was going to Vanessa's house, remember I told you that, that Vanessa and the baby were gonna be out of town. So he was going to collect the money from her sister who also lives at the home. Vanessa's sister's name is Susan. And Sam was supposed to be in and out because this was on a Wednesday and he had work the next day, Thursday. But he never showed back up to Erica and he missed work the next day. And luckily Erica had an alibi for that night. She, after Sam left, spent the night at church and detectives didn't feel as though she was involved. So obviously their next course of action, they want to talk to Vanessa and Susan, which is not hard for them to do. Vanessa's mother is actually a police officer as well. Her father is a councilman. So they urge her to come to talk to police on her own. So January 21st, Vanessa and Susan go in to talk to detectives. So Vanessa comes in and she tells detectives, you know, that she was out of town when Sam disappeared. She said that she was in Mississippi visiting a friend. 
that she hadn't seen in a long time. And she said that Sam was actually the one who encouraged her to take the trip. You know, he encouraged her to go do like a little girl's vacation type of thing. So she was in Mississippi visiting her friend Adrian at the time of the murder. So they continue to talk to Vanessa and she gets to the part where she's talking about the $340 and where Erica said that he had went to go collect this $340 because the two of them were gonna go get an apartment together. Vanessa said that Sam was picking up the $340 for Sam and Vanessa to get an apartment together. So detectives feel like one of these women is lying and delusional, but they gotta figure out which one is which. Vanessa goes on to say that they were gonna get this new apartment because they were getting back together. They had been spending more time together. Sam had been spending the night at her house more frequently. And that he was getting ready to leave Erica. And this is just how I know I could never be a detective because in the midst of all of this, how do you not be like, well girl, the other girl said that he was getting an apartment with her and you telling me that she he get an apartment with you? So which one is it? What's going on? Is he sleeping with the both of y'all? I know detectives can't like necessarily do that because you gotta be professional, but like I would just, I'd be like, girl, are you sure? Tell me about it. Like, anyway. She also started to paint Erica as the delusional one saying that Erica was like, obsessed and she wouldn't leave Sam alone. What happens from here is that detectives are very suspicious of Vanessa, especially since she has this ready to go alibi. There's, am I out of focus? Especially since she has like this ready-made alibi, she had this trip planned, what is really going on? Sam was last, they know for a fact that Sam was last seen alive at Vanessa's home with her sister Susan. So they go in to talk to Susan and detectives try to just lay it out on the table and catch Susan in a lie and pit the two sisters against each other. But it doesn't really work probably because it's so early into the investigation, they don't have enough um, information to do something like this but they basically tell Susan that Vanessa is in the other interrogation room telling detectives that Susan called her after Sam had come over to say that she had accidentally attacked and killed Sam and so they're telling Susan this and she's like that's not true Vanessa's not saying that that's not true because that's not what happened and obviously after this Susan ends the interview and they leave so the two sisters leave why am i out of focus listen to me i will strangle this camera with my own bare hand so the sisters leave the police department and police have really nothing else to go on until the friend vanessa had went to mississippi to visit calls into san antonio police after finding out what happened to sam after finding he had been and dumped in a graveyard in a cemetery. She called in to report Vanessa's suspicious behavior while she was in Mississippi. She says that while Vanessa was there, her phone was blowing up. She kept getting calls and text messages and she was complaining about her phone blowing up. And her friend that was in Mississippi, Adrian, says, well, why is your phone, who's calling you? And Vanessa tells Adrian that, that Sam had gone to her home to pick up something from her sister Susan and there was an altercation. Things just went left, things didn't go as planned. Something bad had happened. And so her friend is like, okay, that's weird. But then her friend goes on to say the next day after that, she and Vanessa went shopping and that Vanessa picked up a really pretty dress. They got their hair done. And when they got back home, Vanessa tried the dress on and her friend asked her, well, like, what are you gonna wear it to? Like, what did you buy it for? And Vanessa says that she's gonna wear it to Sam's funeral. The friend, Adrian, went on to tell police that as she saw what had happened to Sam in the news, and she put the pieces together, you know, that Vanessa had just kind of sprung this trip on her last minute. She called to say she was coming and then the next day she was at her doorstep. She felt as though Vanessa was using her as an alibi. And after talking to her mother about the situation, her mother urged her to call detectives in San Antonio. 
So with this information, they bring Vanessa back into the police department to talk to her again. And they ask her point blank, did you kill Sam? Do you know who killed Sam? And she says, no. So at this point, Vanessa isn't changing her story. She's sticking to the original story that she and Susan had told until they tell Vanessa about Adrian's phone call and the information they had gotten from Adrian. And this is when Vanessa breaks down and starts telling them what really happened. Vanessa tells them, Vanessa tells them that she was unaware of anything happening until after it was all said and done. She said that when Sam went over to collect the money, her sister Susan decided that she wanted to teach him a lesson. Basically beat him up because he hadn't been treating her sister right. She says that Susan was not home by herself, but she was home with her boyfriend and the boyfriend's cousin. And that they basically all jumped Sam. And that this beating had resulted in Sam's death. And Vanessa goes on to say that she had no idea that this was happening until it had happened and she wished that she could have stopped it but she wanted to protect her sister and that is why she didn't tell the truth. So of course the next person they want to talk to is Susan. They still have the two separated. They don't let the two of them talk but they tell Susan what Vanessa had said and this sends Susan into a rage and she says that Vanessa is lying she said it's so much more to it and the story that she tells them knocks detectives off their feet so Susan says that they all lived in the house together this is the same house that burned down but they had rebuilt it remodeled it that kind of thing Vanessa lived there Susan lived there and her boyfriend Susan's boyfriend lived there and she says while Vanessa was giving Sam $340 as a part of the insurance payout, she had received a total of $300,000 for the home. And they had been spending this money together and that Vanessa was kind of like holding the purse and funding their lifestyle, buying them nice things, taking them out on nice dinners as long as they would do things for her but they were running out of money fast. In about the eight to 10 months post the fire, they had already spent most of the money so they needed to get money again. And so Vanessa came up with the scheme for them to kill Sam so she could collect on his life insurance policy and be able to provide and be able to provide the family with more money. Vanessa had a life insurance policy on Sam for 700,000 so Susan is telling detectives all of this and she's telling detectives that Vanessa is evil that she was using this money to control them knowing that they were in a bad spot Susan also used drugs frequently she was clean and sober at this point but it was also a means of her to control her drug habit this kind of thing she painted her sister Vanessa to be a very evil manipulative person Susan goes on to say that Vanessa ordered her to stop taking the medication she was taking for her mental health. She had been mentally unstable before and was on medication to help even and level her out. Vanessa told Susan that if she stopped taking this medication, that if she was caught for Sam, she would serve less time. Susan goes on to say that on the day of the murder, they lured him there with, you know, the promise of this $340, but he didn't know that her boyfriend and her cousin were there. And so when he came in the home, they attacked them. But Susan says she wasn't a part of the attack. She said she ran upstairs because she didn't want anything to do with it. She just wanted to be able to help her sister. She said that when she came back downstairs, Sam was gone. And everything else she knows about what happened was told to her from her boyfriend. So remember, it's the boyfriend and his cousin who is a girl. 
The boyfriend says that they pick Sam up, put him into the trunk of his car. He was still alive, but severely beaten. They drove out to Seguin, Texas, which is about 45 minutes to an hour away from San Antonio, where there was a trailer. and they shot him outside of this trailer and then drove him to the cemetery and dumped his body. So obviously the next people they wanna to talk to are Susan's boyfriend and the cousin Lakeisha. The boyfriend's name is Bernard. When Bernard gets into the interrogation room, he cries the whole entire time. They're not able to get a word out of him. He is just bawling, sobbing, distraught. But they talk to Lakeisha and Lakeisha opens up about the day that the murder happened. So Lakeisha told the same story that Susan had told, very similar, but she didn't know anything about the life insurance money. They had roped her into this whole thing, telling her that Sam was beating Vanessa and he was a very abusive that was her motive for participating. They weren't even gonna give her any of the life insurance money. When they mentioned the life insurance money to Lakeisha, it clicked, it snapped for her, and they real and she realized, you know, why things went so far. Can you imagine being roped in on a murder? Thinking it's for one reason, thinking you're doing kind of like the right thing, getting back on this guy who's been beating on the mother of his son, just to find out that the people who roped you in lied to you so they can get some insurance money and they weren't even going to give you any seven hundred thousand dollars and they weren't even going to give you none so after lakeisha realized that she had been duped she decides to take detectives out to the trailer to show them around to show them what happened and her story matched up with the things that they found on the crime scene the cra and then the craziest thing, so with everybody's admissions, Susan and Lakeisha strike up a deal with the prosecution for lighter sentences for testifying against Vanessa. So Vanessa, out of everybody, gets the heaviest sentence. She is sentenced to 70 years in prison, but her 70 year sentence is later overturned because of an issue with her initial jury. Numerical place cards are placed in the courtroom prior to the arrival of prospective jurors. One bench sign stands out. It provides a designated area for spectators. The reason? In Cameron's first trial in 2012, that wasn't done and was the grounds for her getting a new trial. Her lawyers successfully argued that her constitutional right to a public trial was violated. The judge, in an abundance of caution, made a verbal reference to that by inviting spectators into the proceedings. Is there any uh, anybody from the public that wants to come in to watch the board dire? All right, for the jury. The jury in place, the judge explained that they'll hear only one thing about the case at this point. The charge in this case is a murder charge. Until the panel is selected, that's all they'll know about the accusations against Cameron. So it goes to trial again. Johnson's girlfriend at the time of his murder was the state's first witness. The last time she saw him, Erica Hinton testified, was when he left to collect money from Cameron's sister. I strongly suggested for him not to get the money. I argued with him about that. When he failed to return, she said she became concerned. We got something went wrong. In her second trial, Vanessa kind of steals her own fate. She's sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole because she switches up her story at the end of the trial. She changes her story to Sam being in on this. She says that Sam had been depressed and sad about the state of his life, which we know was not true. He turned his life around. He was feeling much better. He had a baby on the way. He was getting ready to move in with someone that he had been in love with for a very long time. We know that's not true, but she told detectives that they had plotted this together and that Sam was willing to die so that Vanessa could collect the life insurance policy. 
can you imagine first of all changing your story in the middle of the second trial is one thing but can you imagine sam's family sitting in that second trial and listening to vanessa say that and that's how i know i couldn't be a bailiff because i'm gonna step aside and let the victim's family be Go ahead. I'm going to scoot over right just like this. Because, girl, shut up. Okay, so that happened with Vanessa. Lakeisha. And Susan. Both get 20-year sentences for their cooperation. But Bernard Brown, the actual gunman, is acquitted. They don't have anything that ties him to the crime other than the word of the two other women no dna obviously this happened and he was able to go home and clean up no gunshot residue no nothing to link bernard brown to this crime um they found the car sam's car after the fact no fingerprints or anything like that were found in the car and they think it's because bernard brown had a really good lawyer and he was also familiar with the criminal justice system he had been in trouble with the law before and he didn't talk so he kind of knew that there was not enough for them to hold him for the murder even though it's pretty certain that he is or he was the gunman especially the way he reacted in the interview room just crying the whole time they're pretty sure that he is the gunman they just didn't have enough to make this stick in court and he was acquitted but vanessa is the real problem she's the reason all this happened and she was sentenced and she was sentenced to life in prison like i said before another big point in her trial was that the day the body was found the same day she went to the bus station that sam worked for asking about his benefits asking about his life insurance policy whether or not he had it and if he did was she the beneficiary on the same day that he, his body was found i couldn't figure out if like the body was dumped she went in and asked and then the body was found after or if it was before i couldn't find out but still that's very very suspicious okay Whew, is that not insane i think the most unfair thing of <clears throat> The whole case is that he was finally coming to a place where he was comfortable, he was happy, stable, financially about to move in with his new fiance, about to have a new baby, and he was murdered. Brutally behind some life insurance and behind a baby mama that couldn't take no for an answer. <clears throat> I hope I'm mature enough by the time my sons have kids to not beat up their baby mama. Cause right now in this moment, I just feel like if you fuck my son, I'm gonna beat you up. I'm gonna beat you up. Cause they don't have no sisters. I don't have a daughter. So it's up to me. I gotta be. back in Georgia, right outside of Atlanta in Fairborn, Georgia. A very slow, quiet town, obviously not as populous as Atlanta. It is December 22nd, 2017, just a few days shy of Christmas, early on that morning. On that morning, when people were coming in to work at the local Waffle House, they were concerned because there was a car abandoned like in the back of the restaurant and the driver's seat window had also been smashed in. There was glass everywhere. It looked like somebody had stolen a car and dumped it. So Waffle House employees call police out to the scene. When officers get there and take a closer look, they realize that the keys to the car are inside the vehicle. So they call in the tags to see who this car belongs to. The car belongs to 58 year old Tony Abad, but the car has not been reported missing or stolen by Tony. But like I said, it was pretty early in the morning. So they figured Miss Tony had maybe had her car stolen in the middle of the night and hadn't woken up and gotten you know ready for work to see that her car was no longer at her house. So they call Miss Tony, but they can't get anyone on the phone. They can't get Miss Tony on the phone, so they decide to take a closer look at the vehicle. They realize that there is some blood on the front seat, and they decide to pop the trunk. <clears throat> Police open the trunk to find a severely beaten body of an older woman. 
they pretty quickly know this is Miss Tony because Miss Tony worked at the Publix and in the vehicle she was still wearing her Publix uniform with her name tag on and they're able to quickly 100% identify her through fingerprints as well so obviously for detectives this is rather alarming you know this 58 year old woman found in her trunk in the back of a Waffle House still in her work uniform so whatever had happened to her happened shortly after she got off and this was just you know so extremely unusual so of course detectives want to get a better idea of who oops, that was unnecessary. So of course detectives want to get a better idea of who Miss Tony is, who she was. And from what I could tell, she was like very much the quintessential Southern grandma. She had a big family. At the time of her passing, Miss Tony had four sons and five grandchildren who she absolutely adored and they adored her right back. Tony had her first son when she was 15. After that, she got married and had her last three sons with her husband. Her grandbabies absolutely adored her. She was also really loved at work. She was just one of those sweet older women. She worked at the Publix as the deli manager and everyone there loved her as well. So right off the bat, detectives are having a hard time coming up with any kind of motive or anybody who would want any, any harm to come to Miss Tony. And they're thinking this was probably just a random attack, maybe some type of robbery, but the only thing missing from Miss Tony's car is her cell phone. Everything else is there, her purse, her wallet, none of that had been disturbed. But they also believe that she was attacked somewhere else and whatever had happened had happened somewhere else because all of the glass was inside of the car. Like there was no glass on the outside of the car. So wherever the window smashing had happened had to have been somewhere else. And Miss Tony was very badly beaten and very bloody. So there would have been like blood, glass and stuff on the ground, transferring her from the driver's seat to the trunk, that kind of thing. But there was none of that where the car was parked in the back of this Wobble House. It's ultimately decided by the coroner that she had passed away from blunt force trauma. She was alive for some time while she was in this trunk in the back of this Waffle House. She didn't die right away. In talking with Tony's family, everything was peaches and cream. They were getting ready to have like this big Christmas Eve get together that they always had. And Miss Tony had actually scheduled some time off from work so that she could spend time with her grandkids while they were out for Christmas break. So in talking to the family, there was no one that stood out. She wasn't seeing anybody. She was divorced from her last three sons' fathers, but like that had been happened. It was no bad blood there. So the next stop for detectives would be Publix because she was still in her uniform. You know, something must have happened shortly after she left work. Her family said that Tony wasn't the road rage type. She wasn't the type to be randomly rude to people. She went above and beyond and out of her way not to tick people off, to give people the benefit of the doubt, to make sure everybody was nice, calm, collected, and comfortable in her presence. So they just don't understand how this could have happened or why anybody would have wanted to bludgeon her to death. In talking to Tony's co-workers, they said similar things to her family, you know, no BS, no bull, nobody would have wanted to hurt her. But detectives do get a lead from one of Tony's co-workers. Luckily, the night before her body was found in her car, when she was leaving work, she didn't walk out on her own. She and a co-worker walked out together. And this co-worker says that while they were walking to their cars, they were approached by a young woman in the parking lot. It was a young black girl, about 17, 18, and she was wearing a black puffer jacket. Like I said, it's Atlanta. In Christmas time, it's cold. So she's bundled up in this black puffer. And this woman asked them for a ride home. And Miss Tony had said yes. 
And Miss Tony said, yes, the two of them got in the car together and drove away. So obviously from here, detectives go to watch surveillance footage and they see this woman in the black puffer at the front door of the Publix walking back and forth. She's listening to music. She's got headphones in and she's basically just waiting for somebody to come out, it seems. And Miss Tony and her coworker exit the store at 11 30 p.m. So what detectives think is kind of weird is that the woman in the coat, she sees Tony and her coworker exit the Publix, but she doesn't walk up to them right away. Even though she's standing right at the door, she lets them walk to their cars, maybe to see if they're driving together or separately before she approaches this Tony at her car. So detectives are like, you know, that's interesting. But aside from this woman in the puffer jacket getting in the car with Miss Tony, that's all they have. Obviously, once they drive out of the scene, they don't have any more information. But what detectives do decide to do is take Puffer Coat Girl's picture from their surveillance footage and take it around to the different shops in the same shopping center as the Publix to see if they can get an ID on this girl. And detectives actually do get a hit this way. So they pop into a restaurant that's also in the shopping center. And the people who work in this restaurant are like, yeah, we do know that girl. We were actually gonna call the police because for the past couple of days, she had been like in and out of the restaurant, spending most of her time there, just like loitering, sitting around with nowhere else to go. She had bags packed with her and it seems like she just didn't have anywhere else to go. And since the body had been found, they had not seen the girl. And she also had left all of her belongings. She was packing around some stuff with her. She had left all of that in the restaurant and the restaurant still had it. And it was all of her toiletries, clothes. There was also a wallet with an ID. So they're able to ID this person. This person is identified as 18 year old DeAsia Page. So when they look her up, they see that DeAsia had recently withdrawn from high school. So she was technically a dropout, even though at 18, she was damn near almost done. So they go to her mother's address looking for her, but she's not there. Her mother tells detectives that they had recently been bumping heads and that DeAsia had moved out and she had no idea where DeAsia was. DeAsia's mom said that it was the recent change and shift in her that kind of caused turmoil within the home. DeAsia, who was usually, you know, shy, timid, soft-spoken, had recently like flipped the switch and flew off the handle, was hard to deal with, and she had been seeing a new boy. And ever since she met this new boy, she had just been brand new. Y'all know how that goes. I definitely had a teenage rebellion. I definitely had a boy back in the day that had me losing my marbles, child. So no judgment. But that's what DeAsia's mom said she had been dealing with. DeAsia's mom said that this boy's name was Jared Kemp and that she, DeAsia and Jared had met just a few months prior and she had been rocky ever since then. But neither of these kids were bad kids. You know, DeAsia had recently started acting out after she met Jared, but Jared was in military school. You know, like these weren't just like, any kind of kids, they were doing pretty well. But it said that things started to change for Jared because he started hanging out with a different group of people and because he wasn't like that, he was trying to be like that. So he went out of the way to prove himself and he kind of did like a whole 180. You know, he was wearing a jacket that wasn't his. That's not your jacket. Take it out. So to overcompensate, he was doing the most. It said that he would around friends be really rude to DeAsia, call her out of her name. I've been called the B word by one man ever in my life. And to this day, I regret not shoot, not shoot to kill, but you know what I'm saying? Like, how dare you? Why would you say that? Like that is just crossing a line. Things were just getting out of hand. Their relationship was changing. They were in too deep for 18 year old kids, okay? And so ultimately, DeAsia's relationship got so toxic her mom told her, you know, you're 18, I can't tell you what to do, but if you're gonna continue to be in this relationship, you can't live in my house. So you need to leave. And that's exactly what DeAsia did. 
which is so crazy to me. I'm sorry. I don't think I'm gonna be the kicking you out type of mama. I'm just not. I, I'm not built like that. I'm not built for that. I just like, what's kicking you out gonna do? Stress me out even more, child, please. I'm not gonna put on lashes because my eyes are still kind of watery. But I just don't see what the effort and the purpose is of kicking out 18 year olds or expecting 18 year olds to live on their own at all. You can't manage the cat between your legs, let alone a whole household. Absolutely not, absolutely not. Like what about 18 makes a child capable of living on their own? Some kids, some kids, maybe. Not mine though. And while all of this is going on, while they're looking for DeAsia, they're also trying to locate Miss Tony's missing cell phone. And they do get a hit on her cell phone. It's found on a street called Church Street and it's kind of like a back street off of a highway you know a nothing really there dead end type of situation so they go out there to find her phone and it's just thrown on the side of the road church street was only a few miles away from the waffle house so they wonder if their crime had taken place like on this dark back road i'm sitting up here putting eyeliner on my waterline and putting on mascara like my eyes weren't literally falling apart two days ago <laughs> But looking around on this little back, grimy, dark road, it's not dark because it's during the day, but when it happened, it was dark. You know what I'm trying to say? They find, like I said, they find the cell phone, but they also find glass and more blood on the road. Crime scene techs collect the blood as well as the glass to make sure both of them were from Tony's car and obviously from, you know, her blood. But it's gonna take some time for the labs to come back with a report on the glass and the blood. In the meantime, detectives are working on locating the Asia page. So they put a bolo out for her and luckily social media picks up Miss Tony's case as well. And the black puffer coat picture, all of that circulates pretty fast. So the first tip they get in comes from a security guard who works overnight shift at a local Texaco, not too far from the Waffle House, not too far from Church Street. So this security guard who called in meets with detectives and another security guard, and they said they had actually been kind of familiar with DeAsia Page because she had passed by the Texaco on foot a couple of times for about a week prior to the body being found. And she was just walking wrapped up in a blanket, you know, in the freezing cold. You know, they talked a little bit and the security guard told DeAsia, you know, if you're cold, you can go sit in my car for a few minutes in the heat, warm up. <clears throat> so DeAsia took him up on this offer and she had came back a couple of days after the fact to warm up in his car again. And imagine going to sleep in a stranger's car to get a little bit of heat on you instead of just going back to your mama house and dumping that man. Imagine, imagine choosing a man over a warm place to sleep. I ain't never been that delusional, ever. But the man said up until the night of the 21st, things were pretty, that was my oven. <laughs> up until the night of the 21st, things were pretty normal. He said on the 21st, so the night before the body was found, DeAsia came through to the Texaco and she was in a freaked out panic because she said she had just witnessed a woman being killed. And initially, they don't believe DeAsia. They assume she is probably on some type of drugs, like strung out on something. You walk around in the cold in the middle of the night with a blanket thrown over your shoulders, sleeping in people's cars, it, you know? Yeah. But it's not until they saw everything that was happening in the news that they figured, you know, she was probably actually right in telling the truth and not just like tweaking out. And shortly after detectives talk to these two security guards, DeAsia comes in and talks to the detectives on her own. She's wearing the same black puffer with the fur that she's seen wearing in the security tapes. And she's there to give her side of the story. And initially she does admit to getting in the car with Miss Tony. She says they do take a ride because she needed a ride back to the Texaco. But she says as they were making their way to the Texaco, they were stopped at a stop sign by two men who started beating on the car, bust the windows, and pulled them both out of the car and started beating Miss Tony. 
she said that Miss Tony suffered the most in this beating because Miss Tony tried to run away, whereas D Asia cooperated. Is that annoying? I'm sorry. She said Miss Tony got out of the car and tried to run away, but they caught up to her, grabbed her, and started beating her with a bat. She said that there was two guys at first, but then one of them ran away for whatever reason. The guy that was left forced DeAsia to help him put Miss Tony's body into the truck. I'm sure to you, that don't make no damn sense, and to detectives, it didn't make no damn sense. So they assume that she's lying. They don't, so they don't believe her, but they just leave her in the interrogation room to sit, to stew, to fester, to you know sweat a little bit. While they got her in the interrogation room, Jared Kemp also turns himself into a separate police station. But he's not being held, he just goes in to talk to detectives and he basically tells them that he had nothing to do with it. Like, I don't know what she's in there saying, but I wasn't there, it wasn't me, I had nothing to do with it. Me and her actually broke up, I actually haven't seen her in a couple of weeks, so whatever she's saying, baby, it wasn't me. Which is so extremely suspicious. He said their relationship wasn't all that deep and DeAsia was crazy, like not leaving him alone, but he had left her alone. So detectives interviewing DeAsia feel like this is perfect. They're like, okay, well, let's go back into the interrogation room and tell her exactly that. Your man, or lack thereof, is in a different county, different police station, telling detectives that he has not seen you, he wants nothing to do with you, y'all were never in a real relationship, and that you're basically delusional. How does that make you feel? So of course, when they tell her this, her story changes, it flips, and she starts to tell the real truth. She said this whole thing started as a plot for them to steal a car so she could have a place to sleep for the night. How peacefully can you sleep in a stolen vehicle? I don't know. I'll never find out. So at this point, she had only been out of her mom's house for a little over a week. And she had been tired of basically spending her days sitting in restaurants, walking around this shopping center, killing time because she had nowhere else to go. Imagine if she would have stayed in school and just been at school during the day, but I digress. She was tired of sitting in shopping centers all day and then sleeping in the Texaco parking lot at night. She wanted a better solution. So this is when they came up with the plan. And I just feel like this escalated so quickly after only being out of her mom's house for like a week. And I can't, and I also just cannot imagine how y'all escalated to carjacking instead of just going back to stay with y'all mama. But she said it was just supposed to be a carjacking, no extra stuff. And she doesn't know why things escalated. So she says she gets in the car with Miss Tony and Miss Tony's taking direction from her going wherever she says to go and she tells Miss Tony to turn down Church Street and she says she's on the phone with Jared in her earbuds so he can hear everything that's going on. She says that after Miss Tony pulled down Church Street she had a BB gun just to scare Tony but she says Tony like wasn't scared and they started tussling and wrestling over this gun on Church Street and that is when Jared ran up and got involved and he smashes Miss Tony's driver window as the two of them Tony and DeAsia are wrestling over this BB gun and it's crazy to me to think how different this might have went down if Miss Tony would have known that this was a BB gun to begin with you know and that she wasn't in as much <clears throat> and that she wasn't in as much danger as she thought. DeAsia says that Miss Tony ends up on the ground because because he smashes in her window with a baseball bat. So she's crawling over the passenger seat trying to get away. She crawls out of the passenger seat. She's on the ground and he's standing over her with the baseball bat. She pleads to him for a while, you know, saying that it's right before Christmas. Don't do this right before Christmas, that she's got kids and grandkids that she's trying to get home to. But Jared starts beating her with the baseball bat anyway. She says Jared Kemp leaves the scene on foot. He goes about his business and she's the one who drives the car to the Waffle House and leaves it there. She said she ended up at the gas station telling the guys at the Texaco 
that she had just seen a woman being killed because she had was because she was just walking down the street putting her bloody belongings in different trash cans. So with Deasia's confession, they're able to arrest the both of them, but they are originally only charging Deasia with murder. They don't feel as though they have enough to charge Jared just yet. So they arrest him second and they go through his phone. And when they go through his phone, he pretty much tells on himself because the same morning that the body was found, he was searching in his phone, like body found in a trunk, woman found in a trunk, woman found at Waffle House, trying to see in the news if her body had been found yet. So that was suspicious. They also have record of the phone call. So they know that he was on the phone with DeAsia from the time she got in the car with Miss Tony until the time the beating happened. It was FaceTime and regular calls and it was over six hours of phone calls that they had had on the night of the 21st before and after the beating. So obviously him saying that he hadn't talked to her, he hadn't heard from her, he hadn't seen her, he wasn't dating her was a lie. But this isn't necessarily as much evidence as detectives wanted but unfortunately they're just not able to link him in any other way. They got word that the baseball bat was buried in his mother's backyard, but they were never able to recover. So unsure if they had enough evidence to convict Jared on his own, they offer DeAsia a plea deal. You know, she has to give a full confession and she has to testify against Jared Kemp and she agrees. And this works. Jared is found guilty of murder, armed robbery and assault and gets a life sentence. But DeAsia is given a 30 year sentence, which at 18 would probably put her at getting out of jail somewhere near her 50s. She was helping a desperate teenager. Instead, police say that teenager and her boyfriend ended up murdering that public's worker. And now her family is hoping for justice as the boyfriend stands trial. Joe Hankey talked with the family at the courthouse today. We've been here every day since the, since the start um, and we'll continue to be here to see it see it through for my mother. Tony Abad's family says they will be at the Fulton County Courthouse every day for her trial. Abad left behind a family including four sons and five grandchildren and also her second family at a South Fulton public store an hour away from her home. You know, we approached her numerous times trying to get her to work at a, a closer location, but she loved to work at this location because she felt like they needed her and that's the kind of person she was. Four days before Christmas in 2017, investigators say DeAsia Page, who was 18 at the time, walked up to Abad in the public's parking lot near Campbellton Fairburn Road and asked for a ride. From what I've gathered, you know, she had told her that she was beaten by her boyfriend and this and that, you know, that kind of story right at Christmas time, my mom wasn't going to say no to that. Police say Page lured Abad to nearby Church Street where her then 18-year-old boyfriend Jared Kemp was waiting. The pair is charged with armed robbery for allegedly taking Abad's cell phone and murder and assault for allegedly beating her, putting her body in the trunk of her own car and leaving the car behind a Waffle House. Her family says the 58-year-old grandmother died living the only way she knew. Cared more about others than herself, would do anything for you, would give the shirt off her back if it meant to help somebody. She wasn't a woman of great means, uh, but what she did have, she would give to you to help. Now, as attorneys began picking a jury for Kemp's trial, Abed's family says they are closer to closure, but they still need time. There's got to be finality here for us to, to move forward. You know, it's just, it's an open wound that just hasn't gotten treated. And I think ultimately for me, what the most effed up part of this case is, is the timing. Like I told y'all, Miss Tony was about to take some time off to spend the Christmas holidays with her grandkids while they were out of school. Like if Jared and DeAsia would have decided to do this a couple of days later, maybe, you know, nothing would have happened. Maybe this wouldn't have even happened to Miss Tony. You never know, but it's just crazy to think about. Like had it been a day or two later, Miss Tony would still be alive. It's insane, you just never really know. I do have a true crime TikTok that I actually found, but it's from the show To Catch a Predator. So I don't know if like the contents of the video might get the whole video flagged. I'm gonna try to put it in. If the video gets flagged, I'm gonna have to take that part out and I'll just link the TikTok for y'all to watch. But what was crazy for me is that 
they said he was sentenced to five years and for people who were caught on to catch a predator five years was like a lot you mean to tell me y'all going through all this and they not getting a lot of jail time what five years should be the bare minimum and then his wife going back to him and then doubling back and having another baby with him after the fact for girl right i don't know let me know what you guys think in the comments down below today we're watching an episode of the real murders of atlanta which is an oxygen show i think it must be like a play on the real housewives of atlanta but it's the real murders of atlanta um it's pretty interesting this episode that we're watching today it's called catching fire and it's the last episode um in the first season of the series so i'm thinking it's gonna be interesting i'm going for like a wearable purple look today so i'm gonna use the sweetest tea 35 tea palette from morphe y'all have seen this palette on the channel before i might dip into this purple juvia's place palette and then i also have my sour patch palette pulled out it looks a mess because my three-year-old likes to dig in my palettes but um yeah, we can hop straight in. I'm gonna do my brows on camera today. I did my brows on camera last week and it did not go horribly wrong. So hopefully today, knock on wood, it's the same energy. November 11th, 1996, smoldering ash fills Buckhead's air of affluence, bringing new meaning to the phrase, money to burn. Atlanta Fire responds to a call about a house engulfed in flame. All right, so we are obviously in Atlanta, hence the name of the show. <clears throat> on December 11th, 1996, I was just a baby. I was like, like six months old. Atlanta Fire gets called out to a blazing house fire. It's a huge two-story two two house in Buckhead. Not only is the house almost totally engulfed in flames, but even the cars in the driveway are on fire and as the fire department is putting out this big huge raging fire they come across a body and so once firefighters realize that this person is you know gone deceased you know beyond help they wait to extinguish the fire before disturbing this body in any way and right off the bat firefighters are concerned um and suspect some sort of foul play because this person is found on their back and normally when people are caught in a fire unless they die in their bed people are found deceased in fires on their stomach because they are crawling out or they're hunched over trying to get out and they you know fall forward to their stomachs you never really find someone dead on their back who's trying to escape a fire so homicide detectives are called out immediately but the body is so badly burned it's hard to tell what had happened and eventually as they comb through the scene they find a gun which led them to believe that there was some sort of foul play involved it's a nine millimeter handgun and of course they take this in for testing and so um as their crime scene develops as they put this fire out obviously this big huge fire is on the news Friends and family start to show up to their crime scene. And one lady on the scene identifies herself as the girlfriend of the homeowner. And while detectives would have had a hard time identifying the body on their own because of how badly the body was burned, they go ahead and assume that their body is the homeowner, a man by the name of David Coffin. Now, David came from old money, honey. But David's family owned a firm, the Dexter firm, that was said to be the oldest firm on the New York Stock Exchange, okay? David was also heir to a $23 million family fortune, which $23 million in 96, okay? It's a lot of freaking money. And of course, obviously, he was an entrepreneur making his own bread. It's just money everywhere, girl. And even though he was heir to this huge fortune, he had moved to Atlanta to do his own thing, to be known <clears throat> as himself, as an individual, and not the heir to this throne, not this rich kid doing his thing. 
he moved to Atlanta to have his own identity, his own purpose, find his own money, make his own millions. And David was said to be the type of guy that like you wouldn't know had all this money. He was very chill. He, you know, he just wasn't a rich asshole. <laughs> was young and handsome and humble, which is a very rare, rare, rare combination. David Coffin, because of his wealth and his good looks and his personality, there were a lot of women who were chasing him. <laughs> but he really seemed to be kind of playing the field. No, it was great. We did everything together. When we broke up, we always remained friends. Tell me that's not the sweetest voice you've ever heard. Like, oh my God. And David, he wasn't really a playboy, but it was said, you know, that it just seemed like there was no one that really sparked his interest, no woman that made him head over heels enough to commit and stay you know, in a solid relationship, he would date here and there, and then, you know, things would just kind of fizzle out for him. That is until he met Megan Lee. Now, his girlfriend, Megan Lee, is the woman who presented herself outside of the burning house. Remember, we mentioned her before. And so they're talking to Megan outside of this home, asking her, you know, had she heard from David? When's the last time she talked to him? That kind of thing. And this was a Tuesday night. She said the last time she saw David was Monday afternoon and she had been calling him all day Tuesday but could not get a hold of him. <clears throat> and as they're trying to talk to Megan and get an idea of who, when's the last time anybody heard from David alive, they get a call that there was another fire. And since they've already got one fire with one body, this obviously is very alarming to them. So they head out to this next scene. So this next fire is only about a mile and a half away. All right, so this next fire is at the home of a man by the name of Scott Davis. Now, Scott Davis is alive and well, thank God. And his house is not completely destroyed, but he says that, you know, he was in his home that night minding his business when his dog started alerting in the backyard so this made him grab his gun and to go see like what was going on he had a shotgun so he grabbed his shotgun and he went out to see what was going on and he realized like the back of his home was on fire and he saw someone fleeing the scene so he goes outside with his shotgun and as he's headed out to try to stop this perpetrator the perpetrator is trying to get over the fence and starts shooting at Scott. So Scott in return starts letting his shotgun go. He says he shoots at this perpetrator five times, but the person is still able to escape over the fence. And then later the fire department arrives and the fire is extinguished by the time detectives arrive to their second fire. And so Scott is not only telling detectives about this, but he tells detectives a story of what had happened to him just hours prior earlier in the day. Scott tells police that he had left to go to the gym and when he came back, he got out of his car and was headed into his home when someone ran out of his laundry room holding things that they had stolen, a gas can. They also had pepper spray. They pepper sprayed Scott and they also had a gun and threatened Scott with the gun before running away. And so obviously Scott had called the police and reported this incident and only hours later somebody was back trying to burn down his house. And y'all if it already sounds insane to you, Scott goes on to tell police that not only did this man pepper spray him but he also threatened him. This man told Scott if you don't stay away from Megan I'll be back to finish you off. And police are like Megan, so, yeah, the same lady that was at our previous crime scene with David Cook claiming to be his girlfriend is Scott Davis's wife. Now they're in the process. She's trying to get a divorce, but they are still at this point legally married. Megan met Scott Davis when she was a student at the University of Georgia. They dated for like five years and then they finally got married. Scott Davis was a rich young man, come from money. Scott Davis comes from a prominent Atlanta family. 
his father, most of all, is known in all media and all lawyers because he was the forensic psychiatrist that everyone used in murder cases. So his father was well known. And it's that Scott and Megan got divorced because their lifestyles just didn't really mesh. You know, Scott came from money and he was just raised a different way and he held that over Megan's head a lot. Megan said that he was very controlling and that the relationship didn't feel equal and Scott was the type of person to make that known. So they were divorced after only two years of marriage. So a total of seven years together. And it said that David and Megan, they didn't meet and start dating until after the divorce had already been started, you know, after the divorce was already underway. And David's friends and family were said, you know, not to necessarily be Megan's number one fan. They, you know, just saw David as a guy who had everything, who could have anyone he wanted. Why would he choose the girl who's like, currently going through a divorce and she don't have any of her own money. Like they just didn't see her as the best fit, but David was smitten. So uh, detectives obviously double back and talk to me again. And they're asking her, you know, if anything else strange had happened in the past couple of days, if there was anything that she wanted to mention to detectives. And she said, yeah, she said that a few weeks prior on one particular weekend, David had spent the weekend with her. And when he had went back to his home, his home had been broken into. They had taken some of David's computers, watches, and um, they had also stolen his gun. And they found out that David owned a gun, a nine millimeter similar to what was found near his body at the scene of the fire. And so they wonder if this man had been killed with his own gun, which should be extra illegal, first of all. And they also wonder if his house being broken into was related to Scott's house being broken into. Now, as they're digging into David to see like what he was up to, in the days leading up to his murder, they realized that he had reported his car missing or stolen. He drived a Porsche and he had reported it missing just a week prior to the fire. And later that day in Brookhaven, his Porsche would be found on fire. But luckily they are able to get to this car and put the fire out before it is destroyed. And so they're able to bring David's car in for processing. It's also at this time that they found out that the gun found at the crime scene was in fact David's gun that had been stolen and that David had died from a gunshot wound to the head. The fact that David's car was not just stolen, but burned tells investigators someone was clearly targeting him. So right off the bat, police go looking for a suspect because they know whoever broke into David's house and stole his gun was the same person <clears throat> who ultimately ended up killing him and burning down his house. So as they're looking for suspects, they realize that Scott Davis is not taking a divorce very well and that he has been sort of obsessive with Megan especially once he found out that she was dating David. They find out that Scott had been writing Megan these really long, weird love letters. So Scott is their number one prime suspect. So they bring Scott in for questioning. So they bring him in and they ask him to re-explain the first instance that had happened to him Tuesday where he was pepper sprayed. Tell me about what happened in the beginning of your first relationship. I don't know the exact time, but it's around seven. I get out of the car and open the door, and a man stepped out of my laundry room and sprayed me with me. Now, Scott presents himself to be a very level headed man in this interview when they're asking him about the fire and the burglary and all of that. But once they start asking him about Megan, he starts to get a little weird. I went a little ham with the bronzer on this side of my face. But at the same time, I'm not mad about it. You know, they're asking him if he's still in love with Megan. 
and he says yes they're asking him if they're getting back together and she said and he says you know no like because she's not in love with him anymore but he also insists to detectives that you know she isn't in love with anybody else that she's not really seeing anybody else seriously he even tells detectives that he and megan had met up recently to talk about getting back together when scott is talking to detectives they realize scott is a little delusional and that the story he's giving detectives is very different from the story that megan was giving authority suspicions are rising as they interrogate Megan Lee's estranged husband, Scott Davis. Scott said Megan was just going through this right now, that she really loves me. She really wants to be with me. That's why he was fighting the, the divorce. We're trying to get back together. Mm -hmm. What's your... I don't, I don't, I don't think so. I think it's just and Scott makes a slip up. He tells detectives that David Coffin had been shot. And detectives say, what? <laughs> you say what? Because <laughs> this information had not yet been released to the public. As far as the public knows, David Coffin had died in the fire. And when Scott realizes he slipped up, he says, well, at least I think so. I think he was shot. And the detectives are, and detectives are like, well, what makes you think that? Go on, continue. After he realizes he slips up, he starts to blame it on Megan. They're like, you know, who told you that? How did you learn that? How did you figure that out? And he says, well, you know, Megan told me. And detectives don't think this is, you know, the truth right off the bat. But they call Megan and ask her just in case. I heard that from her. That's what, you know, that's what I thought I heard. So, 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 yeah, I thought I heard it tell me that she was shot. I'm telling you what I thought I heard. So we called Megan. She said, hey, can you say anything about David being shot? She goes, oh my God, is that how he died? I'm like, I don't know. She goes, I don't know. I don't know how he's died. And so they bring it back to Scott and they're like, well, Megan said she didn't tell you this. So Scott tries to blame, blame it on somebody else. Scott, Megan, and David have a mutual friend by the name of Greg. And he says, well, Greg must have told me. They call Greg and Greg has the same reaction as Megan. He had no idea how David Coffin had died. So then once they tell Scott this, that, you know, Greg also has the same reaction. He just starts saying, well, I must have heard it from somewhere. I must have heard it from somewhere. Mm. It's not looking too good for Scott circumstantially, but they still don't have any physical evidence to link him to this crime. So they have to take Scott back home. And when they take him back home, they ask him to run through the crime scene again. You know, of the person who had maced him and then later returned to burn down his house. They ask him to run that story back. Remember Scott said that this person had shot at him. So the police are telling him, well, okay, we need to find, you know, the round, you know, let's get up on the roof and see if we can find the round. And Scott says, well, and Scott says, well, you're not going to be able to find it because it went over my head. Like it shot way over my head. And so police are like, okay. The round went over my head. I'm like, how'd you know it went over here? Well, I heard it. I've been shot at a few times. I don't know where the bullets went. Couldn't tell you. And then they go over to look at the fence where the perpetrator supposedly escaped. They're not seeing any kind of ripped clothing, clothing, no sign of a struggle. Remember this man was escaping with a gun and a gas can, all the stuff he needed to start this fire. No spilt gasoline, no nothing. And so they also go out to talk to Scott's neighbors. And there's one neighbor in particular that said she's always out walking her dog. And that on the night in question, she did hear gunshots, but she did not hear gunshots from a small pistol. She only heard shots ring out from a bigger gun from a shotgun and they're like well ma'am you know how do you know like are you sure and she's like yeah I'm sure she's an avid gun user she owns guns she goes out to the gun range pretty often she likes to shoot guns and she says she knows the difference between her guns and she didn't hear any sort of pistol or small handgun go off that night and that she didn't hear six shots Remember, Scott said that he fired at the gunman five times after the gunman shot at him once. And this lady says she only heard five shots. And the same goes for everybody else in the neighborhood. Everybody says that they heard five shots. So Scott's story is crumbling. 
So with this circumstantial evidence, they're able to get a warrant for Scott's arrest. Um, at this point, Scott had lawyered up and um, so the police contact his lawyer and they asked for Scott to turn himself in, which he does. However, they are not sure if they have enough evidence for an indictment. And remember, Scott's dad is this hotshot doctor who's always in and out of the courtrooms. He's someone that lawyers and defense attorneys and prosecutors rely on heavily in the courtroom. So they know they have a very uphill battle and they bring their case to the Atlanta district attorney. But the district attorney says it's not enough that he can't bring this case to trial and the charges against Scott are dropped. And y'all, like many of these stories go, the case goes cold. Megan ends up moving all the way to Australia to start a new life. She was probably trying to get as far away from Scott as possible and probably feeling very guilty. And Scott ends up relocating to California. But luckily, as in many of these cases that go cold in the 80s and the 90s, in 2004, there's a cold case unit opened in Folsom County. And the assistant DA picks up this case and she starts running with it. I got chills when she popped up on the screen because Ain't nothing like a boss bitch coming in to get the shit done, okay? Women get shit done. Women get shit done, period, point blank. And the David Coffin case was the very first case that this new task force had set out to look at. So this new team, fresh eyes, fresh out the gate, they start working on David's case. As DA office investigators re-examine the evidence from the original investigation, they uncover a disturbing new revelation. He also hires a PI to follow her. He asked the PI for what? David Coffin's address. The day before David Coffin's home was burglarized. Oh, where was this evidence before? We had to wait 10 years for this. He says himself, if anyone he knows is sleeping with Megan, he will kill him. A few weeks later, he David did. Coffin's dead. So even though there's no new physical evidence with this new account from the private investigator that Scott had asked for David's address just a day before his home was robbed and his gun was stolen, um, they're pretty sure that Scott is their guy. So they decide to present this new circumstantial evidence to the DA again in November 23rd, 2005, nine years after David's murder, the district attorney decides to indict Scott Davis on the murder. And so he is extradited from California, scooped on up and brought back to Georgia so he can stand trial for the murder, for the murder, for the murder of David Coffin. So of course he goes to jail, but his family obviously pays bail that million dollars they put that up and he is out of jail, obviously, until it's time for him to stay in trial. So both sides are gearing up for trial. Remember that these are two very wealthy families who can out lawyer each other any day. Obviously David's family doesn't need a lawyer, but Scott's family is lawyered the fuck up, ready to you know do whatever they gotta do to make sure their son does not go to jail. Okay, so you know we're watching this for the first time together. I'm gonna make a prediction. I think that Scott does end up going to jail only because of the letters and um, the private investigator, that instance. But I will say if Scott would've just went home and not set his house on fire and not fired his gun and just shut the fuck up, I don't think they would've been able to convict him. But, okay, let me shut up and let's see. So Megan is the first person to take the stand. She comes all the way from Australia with her new husband to take the stand in David's defense. She felt as though she owed it to him and um, his family. She talked about how great the time she spent with him was and how well she was treated by him. Um, she goes on to say how her relationship with Scott was not the best and how 
he got increasingly weird and increasingly scary when she when he found out that she was dating David. She brought up phone records of him calling her 25 times a day. He would call her around the clock. She had saved voice messages of him begging for her to come back. So in his own voice, in his own words, the jury was able to hear how desperate and how scary Scott was sounding. And so Scott Davis, his dad actually takes the stand to alibi him. He says Scott's dad, Dr. Davis, the, you know, the big hot shot, gets on the stand and says that Scott was with him on the night of the murder. And he lying and he don't give a damn girl. The prosecutor, this gorgeous black prosecutor, she says, um, the first time you're mentioning that on the night of the murder, your son was with you is right, right now. You, you didn't hold that in for 10 years and your first time mentioning it, mentioning it is right now. And he says, yeah. Law enforcement that your son was at your home on Saturday, December 7th, is, as you sit here today before this jury. Isn't that correct, Dr. Davis? Correct. Lost. takes the jury a long time to deliberate on this case and the trial was very long as well it was almost seven weeks finally on the fifth day the jury reaches a verdict <laughs> i shit you not my i shit you not you guys my computer just died <laughs> i have to pull it up on my phone <laughs> worst we did everything we could we left it all on the dance floor we fought the good fight. There's really nothing else we could have done to try to bring justice for them or their family. Finally, on the fifth day, the jury reaches a verdict. Thank you, please rise. State of Georgia versus Scott Winfield Davis. We, the jury, find Scott Davis guilty. Yes! Woo. And the jury uh, rendered a uh, verdict of guilty on all counts to me as a homicide detective to be able to go to the victim's family and say i got it i got the person who has killed your loved one there's not a better feeling in this world scott davis is sentenced to life in prison though so no amount of justice will bring back the life taken from david coffin's family and friends all right so that's a wrap on that case it's so crazy to think as i truly feel if he just would have just went home without the antics without the extra stuff without calling the police that they wouldn't have been able to link him to this crime because of the fire there was no physical evidence he linked himself to the crime and interjected himself into this investigation by trying to burn down his house if he would have just sat down and shut up he'd probably still be a free man to this day I love today's makeup so much. I do not want to take it off, but I, it's too hot for me to wear this much cake to work, but I don't want to take it off. I think I might do it anyway. But that is a wrap on another true crime case here on the channel. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe before you leave. I forgot to do one in the last video, but what's today's comment? Okay, so today's comment, leave your true crime baddie emojis in the comments. Like when you think true crime baddie, what emojis do you think these are mine i'll leave mine right here but leave your true crime baddie emojis in the comments all right so we're starting off with shaquanda forbes born into a family of limited means shaquanda forbes has worked hard to make a life for herself she was involved with whatever it took to allow her to survive. This baby was like, oh, I found my sugar daddy. Things just spiraled out of control. Oh, not the case happening in New Orleans. I hate when it's close to home like that. I'm actually going to New Orleans today. That's why I'm up super early. Who is a New Orleans native and she grows up kind of hard in poverty in New Orleans. I don't have not one primer up here. This is empty, empty, hen. So Shaquanda drops out of high school her sophomore year. I feel like we're out of focus really bad and I don't know why. I don't know why. Drops out of high school her sophomore year. She starts stealing, prostituting, and doing things like that to get by. She also gets wrapped up in some theft charges. I wonder if she was like boosting or something like that. And then she gets addicted to crack cocaine. She didn't have the traditional family life. No real support. 
probably very little uh, guidance in what you're supposed to do. Life for Chiquanda only gets tougher throughout her teenage years when she forges her own path. So Jaquana meets this man. It looks like they met in prison from the little show that they, the little reenactment, that's what I'm looking for, that they did. It looks like they met in prison or something, I don't know. But he was in prison because he got popped on a murder charge. He was on death row for 11 years before his conviction was overturned because of a court mishandling type shit. Not because he was innocent, child. Curtis has a past of his own, having spent 11 years on death row on a murder conviction 26 years earlier. 56-year-old Curtis Kyles. He could absolutely be her dad and even possibly in her grandfather. Jaquanda was at a low point in her life when all of a sudden breezes in life and wanted to get to know Jaquanda too. This breathed a new life into Jaquanda. And even though he wasn't like exonerated, his court case was just thrown out because of mishandling of evidence. He was still heavily compensated for the time that he spent in prison. So he had a little money, he had a little bit of game, and he was everything Shaquana was looking for. Girl, where is this going? I feel like this is not gonna go nowhere that's gonna make me happy. Let's see. As a free man, Curtis runs his own business as a small time crack dealer. They were drawn to each other immediately. Most women would run from that, but she actually flocked to it. And while he provides her with drugs, she becomes his beck and call girl. She was doing whatever the hustle required. She's a young girl of the streets who is living basically day to day. So a guy promising affection, uh, financial support, and then the overlay, drugs. Wow, so some women with a will do whatever it takes to hold on to that lifestyle. So Curtis and Shaquana are hustling and bustling, doing what they do, doing their thing. This concealer is so light, Jesus Christ. So one day they decide to help out one of Curtis's neighbors by um, giving her some cash for her EBT card. Y'all know what I'm talking about, don't act like y'all know what I'm talking about, all right? <laughs> so on June 10th, Curtis meets up with his neighbor, 26-year-old Crystal St. Pierre, to strike up a win-win deal. Crystal St. Pierre was down on her luck. Uh, desperate for money to pay her bills and to support her habit. She had $300 worth of food stamps on card and he gave her some cash so they could use her food stamp card. Somebody on Instagram posted the other day about trying to sell her food stamps and I was trying to buy them, but she never messaged me back and I got excited for nothing. But anyway, they take her food stamp card to the grocery store, they filling up their basket, doing their thing. To overflowing, going aisle by aisle, splurging on themselves and getting everything that they could possibly want. Once they got to the register, that's when the trouble started. The clerk tells Curtis the card is declined. But when they get to the counter, the cashier gives them problems with the EBT card. And this seems to be where like the true crime portion of this TV show starts. So they staying in there in the line trying to get the food stamp card to work, but it's not working. They don't know if it's the balance on the food stamp card or if the girl they got it from had given them the wrong pin number, like trying to get over on them. So they call her, but she don't answer her phone. It's going straight to voicemail. So this makes Curtis so mad. He feels embarrassed that he's standing in the middle of this grocery store with this food stamp card and it's not working. He called the girl and she don't answer. It's a line full of people behind them, watching them, embarrassed. So Curtis is pissed, okay? As the line behind the couple gets longer, Chiquanda watches as Curtis gets angrier and angrier, and her man's temper flares at the realization that he may have been played by Crystal. From his generation, women didn't do that to men. That, that's his mentality, and that's what he, what he wanted. He, he was insulted. You have screwed me over, and he had already given over his money, so in the world of the streets you can't allow somebody to take advantage of you like that okay so they don't really necessarily know for a fact that crystal that's the girl's name who gave the new eb2 card i feel like my makeup looks crazy it don't look like that in person what is going on with my camera but anyway like i was saying they go out looking for crystal the girl they got the ebt card from he's not just angry now he's embarrassed and that's a problem is she gonna mess with my money? Hell bent on exacting revenge. The couple goes looking for Chris. Curtis knows where she likes to hang out at. He, Crystal is good friends with one of his old landlords and she used to hang out at this lady's apartment a lot. So he 
goes to this lady's apartment first he banging on the door acting crazy looking for crystal looking for crystal and the lady who's the apartment manager she's like okay you're not about to come in my apartment acting like this let me close the door i'm gonna get her and bring her out to you because you're not about to come in my apartment and make no mess. the quanda unleashed havoc her down the stairs by her hair punching her in the face it was crazy i think Jaquanda did it more out of loyalty to curtis um, I think she wanted to show him her worth in, in that type of situation. Sometimes women can be in relationships where they're often bystanders, but sometimes when the opportunity arises, they can step up, take control, and prove themselves by any means necessary. Crystal comes out of this apartment, and this is when the tables kind of turn. Curtis was the one that was kind of pissed off mad this whole time, but when they get crystal out of this apartment shaquana takes over she pulls crystal down the stairs by her hair beating her up in the parking lot quite literally like going ham on this lady whole time they're never really giving crystal a chance to explain but they shove crystal into the back of their car and drive off Crystal is definitely telling them this is a mistake, that she can make it right, she can make up for it. Brenda tries to intervene, but Curtis tells her to stand down. Curtis turned around and pulled up his shirt and showed Brenda that he had a gun tucked into his waistband. Oh, you gonna die today, bitch! Curtis drives the car as Chiquanda stays in the back seat with her eyes trained on their captive. Crystal tried to fight back. She tried to jump out several times, but to no avail. Jaquanda kept pulling her back into the vehicle. So they're riding around. They drive outside of New Orleans into Jefferson Parish, an old road that, lead, that leads back into some woods. And this is where they pull Crystal out of the car. And Curtis is pointing a gun in her face. And I know this might seem like a little hostile to you guys. And you're probably wondering why things escalated so quick, quickly. Because I'm wondering the same thing. And it's probably because they're all on crack. You know? As soon as the road bend and you couldn't see the street anymore, right there is where they stopped. Curtis gets out of the car, determined to get revenge. Curtis walked to the other side of the car, opened the door, yanked her out and threw her to the ground. She's crying hysterically. I think she knew what was coming. Chaquanda now realizes the enormity of the situation and begins to have doubts. I think Chaquanda was scared throughout. Um, I think she had seen anger. I don't think she had seen it necessarily at that level. <clears throat> so Curtis uses his gun and he shoots Crystal in the back of the head, all behind an EBT card mishap. The hell? That Chaquanda is really shook, like really shaken up by this. And Curtis kind of has to like force her back into the car because she's like just frozen. So they leave Crystal dead on this back road. Like I said, they had driven some way to get her back here. And as they're driving back to New Orleans, they get a call from Curtis's daughter letting him know that like he can't come back because they're looking for him in connection to the abduction. Like. The property manager, his landlord, had called the police after they took Crystal. So they decide to flee to Mississippi. And on their way to Mississippi, Curtis takes off his shirt and he wraps up the gun he'd used to shoot Crystal. And he orders Shaquanda to throw this gun out of the car like as they're driving. And so that's what they do. And it said once they are in Mississippi, Shaquanda, you know, she wants out. She doesn't want to be a part of this. She doesn't want to be wrapped up in no murder charge. And she's asking Curtis if she can leave. But obviously he says no. Curtis, I have to get out of here. Tensions rise and things between the couple go from bad to worse. He had just committed a murder. There's a lot of arguing between the two. Shaquanda wants to leave the situation because I think she was scared, but Curtis was having no part of that. Have you lost your damn mind? He beat her. He, he hit her in the eye, beat her about the head, and he let her know she wasn't going anywhere. Everything moves pretty quickly. So after the abduction, they the police obviously go to talk to Brenda, the property manager, and she tells them what she knows about the whole EBT thing. So they go back 
and they watch security camera footage from the I was supposed to say hospital from the grocery store and they see Curtis like outside on the phone very upset like in a rage and they see you know what's going on inside the grocery store with the car declining all of that and then shortly after this a contractor who's walking along this like wooded area where they left the body finds Crystal's body and calls it into the police and for whatever reason the couple does not turn off their cell phones so they're found in Mississippi shortly after the murder about a week later and they go scoop them up super easily super quickly they don't think like that the police are coming they figured it's been a week and that they've gotten away with it so they're pretty you know chilling they don't have much of a guard up and so when the police swoop in and pick them up it's very easy Curtis isn't talking to police very much but we know he's been here before Curtis refused to, to provide any type of statement he said I'm not talking to you I, I mean I've seen people be scared be worried be arrogant he was just quietly callous. I don't talk to cops. But Shaquanda pours her heart out. Curtis. But Shaquanda, on the other hand, is singing like a canary. Which isn't surprising because of how, like, things went in the end with him beating her up and basically holding her kidnapped too after she wanted to leave and go to the police while they were in Mississippi, remember? But Shaquanda's cooperation makes things super easy for detectives. It was the person who pulled the trigger. Curtis was the driving force. And she cooperated almost immediately from when, you know, we took her into custody. She cuts a deal and testifies against her man at his trial. She said, get to screw him over. She just went along with that. Curtis Kyles is found guilty of second degree murder and he receives a life sentence. So Shaquanda cuts a deal and she is able to testify against Curtis in his trial, which obviously helps out the prosecution. And Curtis is found guilty of second degree murder. And Shaquanda pleads guilty to the kidnapping charge and has to, or is sentenced to 15 years. She probably didn't have to serve the full 15. In an ironic twist of fate, Investigators learned that Crystal did not swindle Curtis as he assumed. Curtis entered the wrong pen. She had the money there, and she had the proper pen and all that. Curtis is looking at the wrong number putting in as the pen. In the end, it's Shaquanda Forbes who got swindled out of her freedom when she pinned all her hopes and dreams on her man. Shaquanda's biggest mistake was not walking away from Curtis once she found out he was on death row for 14 years. And that's crazy as hell. Killed this girl behind a damn food stamp car the whole time you were not entering the pen correctly. But like I said, I think it just got so hostile because they were all on crack. But because Shaquanda testified against Curtis, she had the second degree murder charges dropped against her. So what did this young girl get herself into? Jesus. But that is where this case ends. I was not expecting it to be so short. I'm not sure why it's so short. Today's case is really wild, so just get ready, girl. And longtime resident Linda Robinson has lived in this area for about 15 years. The neighborhood was quiet and well kept. Everybody who lived in this neighborhood had kind of been there for a long time. So everybody was really respectful of the properties, respectful of everybody else's space. And it was a great place to live. Was. And Linda is living on her own. She is widowed. Her husband has passed away. But they do have three children and grandchildren that visit often. And because Linda is living alone in this house and she no longer has her husband, they're just things, you know, around the house that it's nicer if you have a man to do. Not saying that women can't mow the grass and change the oil in a car, clean the gutters, that kind of thing. But girl, it's so much nicer when you got a man to do it for you. You know what I'm saying? So luckily, Linda has a neighbor, Joe Jackson, who's willing to help her do that kind of stuff around the house. The level around the house and Joe didn't just help Linda out around her home he was kind of like the neighborhood Mr. Fix-It he was into contracting and he had a lot of tools and there was really just nothing he couldn't do 
And Miss Linda appreciated Joe greatly. She would, you know, offer him money for the things that he was doing around the house for her. And, you know, she didn't take this help for granted at all whatsoever. And when he wouldn't accept the money, you know, she would invite, invite him over for dinner. And, you know, just doing a little thing to try to show that she appreciated him, you know, helping her out as much as he could. And the more Joe did around the house, the more time he and Linda would spend together. He started having dinner with the family and that kind of thing. And they got along very well. Joe had kind of fallen onto hard times after a rocky divorce. Um, it was said that, you know, his wife left him and kind of took all of his money with her. So he was struggling to provide around the house. He also was like a dog man. You know, he had a lot of dogs. And so caring for himself and his dogs, obviously that costed a little bit of money. So when he did fall on these hard times, he was borrowing money from Linda and she was more than happy to help him after, you know, he had helped her so much over the years. Joe also starts cutting grass around the neighborhood just to try to make, you know, some extra cash. He has garage sales and starts selling some of his tools, you know. But dynamics around the neighborhood started to change when Miss Linda found some new love in her life. She met a man by the name of Wilbur. I literally just threw my foundation behind my back and broke it. A whole $50 bottle of foundation is on the floor. It actually, oh my God, it's me again, me again, me again, me again. I don't even remember what I'm saying. So Miss Linda met a name, man by the name of Wilbert when she was out dancing one night. They kind of danced together that night and hit it off. And so Wilbert slowly but surely became, you know, the new man around the house for Linda. And the little things that she once needed Joe for, you know, she no longer needed him to do. You know, Joe would try to do things around the house for Linda but it's like Wilbert would always just beat him to it and he was always looking for things to do for Linda but she told him you know that's okay Wilbert is going to take care of that for me you know you don't have to worry about it and this started to rub Joe the wrong way and cause tension between he and Wilbert but now as things start to get super tight for Joe he kind of lucks out when a new neighbor moves directly next door to Miss Linda. This woman is a woman by the name of Jane Cunningham. And when she first moves in, Joe kind of goes over to introduce himself. You know, he's the neighborhood Mr. Fix-It if she needs anything done to holler at him. And this initial introduction ends up leading to a relationship. Now, whether Mr. Joe was actually attracted to this woman or he just needed a place to stay, we don't know but he eventually ends up moving into the house right next door to linda with miss jane and as this relationship started to like blossom you know people in the neighborhood started talking like this is a little weird you know and of course because he's living now right next door things between joe and wilbert start to escalate and one of these things being is that the there is a patch of grass in between both the driveways so miss linda's house miss jane's house driveways patch of grass this patch of grass was said to be miss jane's property not linda's however miss linda was you know accustomed to parking there she would park there a lot not necessarily all up in the grass but would you know be halfway into this grassy patch it said that they didn't like her parking there or wilbert parking there because their cars would leave tracks in like you know muddy patches in the grass so they start arguing about this little patch of grass in between the two homes so jane and joe started to put you know like no trespassing signs up in this area but it said that that didn't really help it said that <laughs> joe <laughs> It said that Wilbert and Linda would sometimes even drive directly over these signs, not even paying attention. So Joe decided to escalate the situation. And what he started to do was put wooden like planks with nails smashed into them. Like so the, the points of the nails are sticking up. 
into this little grassy area. And so one day, you know, Miss Linda is getting out of her car and she almost steps down onto one of these nail planks. And so obviously this causes a big rift between Joe and Wilbur because I get it. You don't want me to park in your damn grass, but you're gonna put a nail in my foot because I'm parking in your grass. That's doing a lot, Miss Mamas. That is, that's kind of drastic. That's kind of drastic, all right? And so the next source of tension between these two neighbors would be Joe and Jane's dogs. Remember I said Joe was a dog man? Well, Linda was a dog lady. And between the two of them, they had a lot of big outside dogs. And so these bigger breed dogs, obviously they make a lot of noise. They were barking all the time. And hell, like, you know, you have that one neighbor with the one big dog that don't shut up. Can you imagine it being like five or six dogs in the backyard not shutting up? Like, I can imagine. That was probably annoying. And so as if six dogs ain't enough, Joe and Linda decide to start breeding these dogs with the hopes of being able to sell them. And it got ridiculously out of hand. I think I said Linda just now, I meant to say Jane. So Jane said herself that at one point she counted up to 35 dogs in this backyard. Like it got really out of hand, but Jane and Joe, they loved their dogs and they weren't getting rid of them. You know, it was just something that they put up with. And so obviously all these damn dogs caused even more tension between these two neighbors. I mean, can you imagine having 35 dogs in your neighbor's backyard going ham all day? And then eventually, you guys, the dogs started to just smell. You know, it's a bunch of them in this one backyard. How can you keep 35 dogs clean, you know, in a backyard? It got super stinky, all right? Like that's gotta be a lot of urine. Okay, I gotta do the math. How many times a day does a dog pee? Okay, Google says that ideally adult dogs should be allowed outside to relieve themselves at least, th at least three to five times a day. So can you imagine 35 dogs peeing and pooping five times a day in this one backyard? Oh, I know that must've smelled so bad. Oh Lord. So obviously this smell starts to worry Linda and her family. And so, you know, they ask Joe, are you gonna do something about how funky your dogs are? And Joe says like, you know, he don't smell it. You know, he don't smell anything. He's keeping it as clean as he possibly can. And you know, there's nothing else for him to do. But can you imagine having 35 dogs in your backyard and acting like you don't smell that? Maybe because like once you got that much, you probably smell like it too. You know what I'm saying? Like it's probably a bigger, like, mm, like him and them dogs was probably just funky as hell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And eventually Wilbur and Joe kind of have words in the front yard. Um, Wilbur is kind of fed up of the stench and he tells Joe, you know, um, you got to do something about these dogs or I'm going to take care of it. You want me to do it or are you going to do it? Pick a side, pick which one you want to do. But if I take care of these dogs, you're not going to be happy about it. And they almost actually get into like a physical altercation, but it's broken up by the women. Now, remember I told you guys that Linda had three kids. She had two daughters and a son. And her son, whose name is James, he had spent some time away. He had gotten into some legal trouble in his younger years and ended up going to prison. And he is finally released and is back home in the midst of like their feud with Joe. And you know, when he is finally released and he's back home, he comes home to find not, you know, his mother at peace, but his mama being terrorized by this crazy neighbor with 52 damn dogs in the backyard. And this obviously does not sit well with James. The smell of funky dog is starting to permeate into Linda's home. And it's just, you know, it's not fun, it's not cute. They can't enjoy their dinners and suppers or have barbecues or invite people over because everything smells like dirty dog. So James and Joe actually, you know, have words, but they exchange words. So now the tension isn't just between Wilbert and Joe, but James is in the mix. 
and um linda kind of sees things getting out of hand and she finally decides to call the police and let them know you know what has been going on and obviously when the police arrives he's like taken back by the smell of it all but then when he takes himself over to Jane and Joel's property to kind of see the state of the backyard, I mean, he is just disgusted by what he finds. There's so much feces and just nastiness in this backyard. They ask Jane, you know, like, why didn't she call way sooner? Okay, I've definitely messed up this side, but I'm just about to put rhinestones on it to fix it. And then I feel like I need to do this look again because I messed it up. <laughs> So the cops go over and they talk to Joe and shit and Joe is just as rude to the cops as he is to Linda and her family. You know, the cops tell him that he needs to clean up the backyard and make things, you know, nicer and get rid of the smell. And Joe does do a little bit to try to keep the yard clean, but it's again a bajillion and two dogs back there. So he can only do so much. Like you clean up one pile of poop and then the dog next to you is just making a new one. And things really come to a head when Joe and James' dogs start dying. And when I mean they start dying, I mean it's dog bodies everywhere. Like they all just start to drop dead. And Joe and Jane thought that their dogs had been being poisoned. And, and Joe assumed it had to be Linda and her family. And so what Joe and Jane decide to do next is absolutely horrifying. Joe decides to dig a hole in the backyard, lowers the dead dogs into this hole, and he douses them with gasoline and starts burning the bodies of these dead dogs. But I'm sorry, can you imagine coming home after a long day of work to the smell of your neighbors burning a bunch of dead dogs in their backyard? Can you imagine that? I would have had to call somebody, call the HOA, call the ASPCA, 911, somebody. Because if you wouldn't have stopped burning them dogs, baby, I don't know what I would have done. But can, that smell would have literally drove me insane, I think. So Joe, of course, feels like Linda and her family are the one killing his dogs off. And this makes them and this makes him obviously super angry. So tensions between the two neighbors just continue to rise. And so his dogs dying obviously just sent Joe into a spiral. And he said that he would see Wilbert and James throwing food over the fence to the dogs and he assumed you know that's why his dogs were dying but Wilbert and James said that, that that was never the case they never did that but it's really bold of Joe and Jane to feel like Linda and her family is the only people in this neighborhood who want the dogs dead because I'm sure they're not the only people smelling them the whole neighborhood probably had a hand in killing these dogs but we don't know that like, I know that killing these dogs is obviously never the answer. Like, we don't want to kill nobody's pets. But being fed up is fed up. <clears throat> and I probably would have got tired of living next to these dirty-ass, nasty-ass, funky-ass dogs as well. Joe saw the neighbors using antifreeze, you know, while working on their cars. And he just assumed that, you know, that was what they were using to poison his dogs. And I'm sorry to say it, but I'm just sure that these people, Linda and her family, were not the only people in the neighborhood who wanted these funky ass dogs dead. They also see Joe spiraling. Um, they see him, you know, outside his house in the same clothes a couple days, you know, in a row. He's not taking care of himself. He's not shaving. He starts to look like a crazy old man. And if Joe's behavior wasn't already wild enough, <clears throat> he starts spending time in the backyard, like incognito, blending in with the dogs, laying under blankets, hiding. He was just hiding out and blending in and trying to catch someone in the act of messing with his dogs. And things really started getting out of hand when Joe told Linda's daughter that he was going to kill everybody in the house. Linda calls 911, but police say there's nothing they can do outside of giving Joe a warning. They go over and they talk to him, and that is it. 
And one day, unfortunately, Joe's dogs would get loose. They broke through the fence. They broke through the shared fence of their backyard space and uh, all these dogs start coming through the, this hole in the fence and James is outside and these dogs start to maul him and he has to fight for his life against these dogs. Luckily he's able to grab some sort of weapon and starts fighting back but it is a bloody mess. The dogs are bloody, James is bloody and it is just an all out brawl. James versus all of the dogs. And I don't feel like this fence just happened to give out on this particular day when J when James just so happened to be in the backyard, you know what I'm saying? But that's just how I feel. However, after this attack, Linda decides to call animal control like it's too much. And so animal control comes out and they threaten to take all of Joe's dogs. I mean, animal control is out there rounding these dogs up, putting them in the back of the truck about to drive off when Jane and Joe, you know, finally come out. In some kind of way, they're able to convince animal control to let them keep all of these dogs. So again, Linda and her family are left stuck in the same position with no help. And after this, tensions between these two neighbors are just so high. Obviously, Linda and her family are upset that James was attacked by all of these dogs and Joe and Jane feel like the victims because they feel like Linda's family is trying to take their pets away from them. So on October 3rd, 2013, things take their final left turn. So on this morning in particular, Linda says she's woken up by Joe just kind of spiraling in his backyard she can hear him saying i'm gonna get you i'm gonna get you like he's losing his shit okay and it just so happens that this day james arrives to his mother's home and he pulls into the grassy patch the one they've been fighting over since the beginning and when joe sees him pull into this grassy grassy patch it sends him into a whirlwind spiral. He's very upset and he's telling James, you know, you need to move, you need to get off my grass. And um, they start to just have words. James is fed up, Joe is fed up. And eventually Joe pulls out a gun. But James does not back down, which is very bold of him because I'm the type of person, you pull a gun on me, baby. <laughs> I'm just going by my business. Unless I got my gun too, you know, that's different. But you know, if you don't want the gun, there's only so much I can do. But James does not back down. He's not scared of this old ass man. And um, you know, they continue to have words in the middle of the street whilst Joe has, you know, a gun drawn at James's face. And unfortunately, they are just both very much with the shits. And um, Linda is inside her house when she hears a gunshot. Seven years of this crap I put up I said, you've done a lot of things to me. You've done a lot of things to my dogs. You're going to poison my dogs. No one poisoned your dogs. But on that 23rd of 2013, it's escalating. And so Linda comes out of her house to see her son laying in the street. When she runs up to him, he is bleeding from the neck and um, cautioning her to get back inside. Linda is torn between going inside and calling for help, but not wanting to leave her son to die alone in the street. So she starts yelling for help, yelling for someone to dial 911. And after the shooting, Joe goes inside to call Jane and let her know that she needs to come home and take care of the dogs. Eventually the police are called and they arrest Joe. When police enter this home, it is absolutely disgusting. Disgusting. I can't even put it into words. I just have to put the pictures on the screen for you guys. Like this is the house. This is the backyard with some of the dogs. You can see how many there are. A bedroom, bedroom, the entry door, paper towels and newspapers down the hallway. Just a total wreck. I can only imagine how it must have smelled inside of this home that Jane and Joe were living in and acting like everything was okay. Like I wonder if like the police or the animal control people, if they would have just gone inside this home, like would they have let it continue the way it did? But girl, this house is a mess. Now in 2014, Joe Jackson is sentenced to only 
seven years for aggravated assault because luckily James survives this attack. Um, however, he is left paralyzed from the waist down. So since then, Joe has been released from prison. Jane eventually moved out of the neighborhood after the trial and all of that. But I couldn't find any information on what they're up to now. But it's crazy to think after shooting to kill, he only got seven years. Like, that's crazy. My eyelash is not sticking. But tell me that case wasn't absolutely insane. It's the burn of the dogs for me. I just wouldn't have been able to stomach that. Like, mentally, that probably would have drove me insane. And I would have lost it. Like, I would have been knocking on his door. Something would have had to give. As always, leave me your thoughts and opinions on this case in the comments down below. But that is a wrap on this case. That is where we leave off. That is where we leave off for today. I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. Like always, make sure you subscribe before you leave. And I'll see y'all next time. Bye.